We're good to go, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Jared. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the June Marine Fish Advisory Commission meeting. Uh, I'm Ray Kane, Chairman, and I am going to, I guess on this agenda, we will be taking a biological break around 1015, if, if everybody's good with that. Ray, do you want that to be a, a break of a certain time limit? Uh, 15 minutes. Okay. At 10.15, we'll take a 15-minute break. Good. Thanks. Thank and if need be, the uh, vice chair is on, so he can conduct the meeting if necessary after 15 minutes. Sounds good. Okay. Well, that's, that's it for me. I would like to turn this over to Commissioner Tom O'Shea. Uh, he's new to the Division of Fish and Game. He is our, he is the replacement for Ron Amidon. So, Commissioner, if you'd like the floor, introduce yourself. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this is Tom O'Shea. Can everybody hear me? Yes, we can. Great. Uh, appreciate the opportunity um, to introduce myself, and uh, I'm excited to um, now be uh, in the role of Commissioner of Department of Fish and Game. Uh, department that uh, I previously had uh, worked for for 15 years um, with the Division of Fisheries and Wildlife. Uh, when I left 10 years ago, I was the uh, Chief of Wildlife. Uh, prior to that, the Southeast District Manager and had started as a, uh, as a forester uh, working on habitat management. Um, after I left uh, the division, in 2013, I was uh, with the um, trustees of reservation and um, more recently just left as the vice president of conservation and resilience and worked a lot on um, coastal resilience on uh, the 76 miles of coast and, uh, and also all of our um, habitat conservation work as well, um, co-authored two state of the coast reports. So definitely got me engaged in marine issues. Um, Happy to be uh, now in this role and excited to start. I've uh, been uh, touring um, with Dan, um, went to the New Bedford facilities recently and have met a lot of the staff and really excited. And um, it, myself, I'm a recreational saltwater angler um, and uh, really enjoy that with my son and um, have been that, have been doing that since I was a kid. Um, so certainly love the coast and uh, look forward to meeting all of you uh, in in the coming meetings. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Commissioner. Questions for uh, Commissioner Tom O'Shea? I'm not seeing any hands, Mr. Chair. Not seeing any hands. Thank you, Commissioner. I'll turn this over to uh, Lieutenant Bass from uh, Morrison. Mr. Chair, we need to uh, review the June agenda and the May minutes. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Uh, yeah, let's, let's uh, review the June agenda. Does anybody want changes on this agenda as so presented? So, so um, Ray, as you know, uh, you've called for a 15 minute break at 1015. So I guess that would be part of this this uh, amended agenda. We can take that informally, Dan. We take frequent okay. breaks during this. We don't need to amend the agenda to accommodate that. That would be new items for discussion. All right. Thanks, Jared. Thank you, Jared. I'm not seeing any um, hands raised, Mr. Chair, for motions to amend the agenda. The agenda is going to move forward as is. Thank you, Jared. Uh, review and approval of the May 23 business meeting, which was held at the New Bedford office. That was an in-person meeting. Has everybody reviewed the document? And does anybody want to make any edits? Not seeing any hands raised for edits. We need a motion to approve. I move that we approve the minutes. Second. Motion to approve. I'll second it. Okay, it was moved by Bill Amru, seconded by Shelly Evanson. Thank you very much. All right, Mr. Chair, we need a roll call vote for approval of items. Okay, roll call vote. Shelly Edmondson. Kelly? Yes. Khalil? Yes. Lou Williams? 
Yes. No Amaru. Yes. Mike Piernock. Michael yes. Piernock. Yes. Thank you. Suki Sawyer. Yes. Bill Doyle. Yes. I think we've got everybody there, Jared. Tim Brady. Tim Brady, I'm sorry. That's Tim. Okay. That's a yes from Tim Brady. Thank you, Tim. Motion approved. Moving on, we can move on to law enforcement. Lieutenant Bass, your report, please. Hi, good morning. I'll try to be a try to be brief. Uh, it is tis the season. We uh, seem to be in full swing with just about every commercial and recreational fishery we have a uh, have going now. We do have the commercial striped bass season opening up. There's a little confusion. People are asking if that uh, if this holiday on Monday um, is an open or closed day, but by the regulation, it's just a third, fourth, and Labor Day. Um, that are closed. So um, it should open uh, the 19th. Um, I did have a question at uh, the previous meeting about the MEP uh, Environmental Police Trust Fund. Couldn't quite answer. That was uh, set up a, a number of years ago to take in some funds from uh, citations as well as uh, it's the ability to take in from some libels and, and other decisions. So I think um, I mentioned that uh, the large decision, uh, 70 something thousand from the Menhaden case went into the fund as well as I think the tune of the Tim Ott, uh, 14 something thousand also went in there. Uh, and that uh, apparently is also working. I'm, I'm assured that, um, you know, it's a tremendous asset to be able to, you know, bridge the gaps in like the end of the fiscal year or some overtime or directed patrols or whatnot. So um, hopefully, hopefully that answers that. And if uh, I, have, I have nothing further, if, um, if there's any questions. Question for Lieutenant Bass. Suki? Yeah, Sherry, thanks. Yeah, yeah, Ray, thank you. A uh, little disappointed about that article about what happened in Beverly. I, what is the reasoning behind all that? Do you know what I'm talking about? Uh, you, you and us uh, both, uh, obviously very disappointed with that decision. That case um, did, I think, start at the beginning or pre-COVID, so it did stretch out a bit. So um, that that's always probably in the defense's favor. Um, I think a lot of the news articles were, um, I, I think, primarily generated by the defense, um, saying there's some procedural issues, uh, evidence, uh, you know, enforcement action issues. I think um, we could maybe to sum it up. I think one of the the big uh, points that we couldn't comply with was in order to um, um, name some anonymous or confidential sources that the officer just wasn't going to do um, as per an agreement. So with that, we couldn't fulfill that order. So the case was ultimately dismissed. Okay, still don't like the outcome of that. I just I hope that's not going to be the way things go going forward from here because uh, lawyers can be pretty shady about this stuff, I guess. So yeah, I, I, I'm assured I've, I've read the case. I was you know, not obviously involved, but I think it's, there is at the end of the day that, you know, it, it's not a precedent setting decision and all our procedures and, and, and actions were all found to be lawful. Um, it's sometimes, uh, you know, it's the decision of the judge. And like we said, we're, uh, we're disappointed with it as well. Okay. Thanks for that, Lieutenant Bass. Thank you, Suki. Uh, questions for Lieutenant Bass. From other commission members. Not seeing any hands raised, Mr. Chair. Not seeing any. I have one question, Lieutenant Bass. How are we doing on recruitment for future law enforcement officers? We have a, a number of uh, the interviews are still ongoing. Uh, I, we just had one graduate from the academy, which was, um, I think, a backfill from a COVID issue. They're still in the process, and I still think we're looking good for the hiring of 14. And I believe that's uh, two, you know, the, the date is August 1st. Um, from what I understand, um, at least of the people that have been tentatively hired, I think five are already on the job. They're already police officers. So they would, um, wouldn't would have to go through the five or six months of the police academy. So we could get them, you know, kind of spun up and trained in the field training sooner. Um, but from what I understand, we're still on course for 14 as of August. Thank you, Lieutenant Bass. So our numbers are increasing slowly but surely. Is that what I'm to understand? I, that would be, I think, trying to do the math from uh, who 
you know, mandatory retirements and whatnot would be a would be an increase this year. Yes, sir. And also, does law enforcement need a letter from commission members once again to the governor's office stating our concerns about getting more boots on the ground? So these regulations that DMF and we vote on are actually enforceable. Absolutely. Um, 14 is, is, is a big jump. It's one of the larger classes we had, but to continue um, to gain officers, uh, you know, we're still, I think, 40 or so short um, that this, this kind of hiring still needs to continue year after year because we do have a lot of, uh, you know, attrition and, and retirements and whatnot. So this, this is a, a great gain for this year, but if, there's, if we don't have any gains next year, the year after, it's, um, we'll, we'll just be heading backwards again. Right. Thank you. So, Jared, I have to ask you, do I need to make a motion that we as a commission put a letter together and send it to the governor's office? Or... No, I can put that letter together um, for you and then we can have a vote on it at the um, next meeting. And that would be at the July meeting. Correct. I... Yeah. OK, thank you very much. Yep. Thanks for bringing that up, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yeah. Any other questions for Lieutenant Bass? Not seeing any hands raised, Mr. Chair. Not seeing any. Director Dan McKeon, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, first, I'd like to commend the staff, and I believe that's a, a, the team of Julia and Jared uh, Silver for putting together those minutes. Uh, they were very well done. Um, obviously, it was a it was a uh, detailed and and uh, sometimes contentious meeting, but I think the minutes did a great job of capturing uh, the proceedings. Um, I'd also like to welcome our new commissioner, Tom, um, you know, because he has such experience in the Department of Fish and Game, you know, that people use the expression hit the ground running, but Tom really hits, has been able to hit the ground sprinting. He was, uh, his appointment was uh, delayed compared to some of the other commissioners. And so um, he's had some catch up to do in, in terms of some of the initiatives, but uh, we've been working closely with him and I've been meeting with him weekly um, to bring him up to speed on all things DMF and really look forward to, to working with him uh, during his tenure. Um, financial assistance programs have been very busy for us. Uh, there's three that I'd like to mention. We are uh, cutting the checks uh, or we just cut the checks. Or when I say we, uh, Mass Lobsterman's Association was our sort of a, a, a partner for us. Uh, we got a half a million dollars from the legislature to uh, uh, allow uh, the duly permitted lobstermen, those with state and federal permits, who are known to fish both sides of the uh, territorial seas line, to buy a second set of buoy lines because our buoy line requirements uh, were pretty burdensome in terms of having a different color scheme in the line as soon as you go over the imaginary line into state or federal waters. And uh, the resolution that um, that some of the lobstermen came to us is said, saying it's too difficult to to make these changes at sea, it's easier if we just have a second set of buoy lines. And, and thanks to the legislature and Bruce Tarr in particular, um, the uh, funds were allocated last in last in this year's budget, which is coming to an end of the fiscal year. But uh, thanks to MLA for helping us get those checks out. Those checks, I think, averaged around four thousand a piece, uh, which is what it costs for a, a complete set of second buoy lines for the for fishermen. Um, the next one is. Uh, the vessel trackers, uh, we're reimbursing federal permit holders for their vessel trackers. That was a congressional appropriation uh, for us, but we're giving out $1,500 checks for uh, the uh, all federally permitted Massachusetts lobster vessels to, um, to install a uh, tracking device. $1,500 gets you the device and uh, a, a many years of, of service. So it's kind of like a cell phone bill, uh, but the $1,500, at least for one company, uh, was seven years of service, which was uh, really great. Um, other states are doing it as well. And so, uh, you know, but we were first and we were going to have data that's going to demonstrate the footprint of the Massachusetts lobster fishery uh, uh, sooner than other states. And that's really going to be valuable relative to uh, offshore wind development, offshore wind, um, you know, mitigation and compensation, but also uh, a, a more refined right whale uh, risk reduction model, because we're going to know where the gear is. It's always uh, a challenge to figure out 
that out, especially with uh, Lobsim and that up till now haven't had VMS requirements, but the VMS meaning vessel monitoring systems. And finally, the sea herring disaster payments uh, are going out tomorrow. And uh, that's a couple of million dollars uh, uh, shared among uh, vessels and uh, dealers. And uh, those checks uh, are going out. That's again, it's a federal appropriation and um, the, the Governor Baker requested uh, relief, I think, at least two years ago, maybe going on three. That some of these things take time, but as long as the, the, the vessels are still involved with the fishery, they're eligible. So we set aside 60% for vessels and 40% for dealers. Uh, and in some cases, uh, the, the dealers and the vessels uh, were uh, the same entity, but, um, but we were pretty happy with how that all worked out. And thanks to the staff for, for helping with that. Um, my next topic has to do with the Belding Award. If you commission remembers last year, we gave the Belding Award to Mark Amarello, one of the uh, former uh, Marine Fisheries Advisory Commission members and longtime chair. We've um, given this award out since 1990, and it was uh, to individuals who have done the most to promote the conservation and sustainable use of the Commonwealth's marine resources. Among the 17 uh, awards, we've had five who have been uh, former commission members, um, not just because of their commission, uh, you know, contributions, but uh, folks like Tony Verger, you know, who was, we all know, is a, uh, also an ASMFC delegate and, uh, and a state legislator. Um, Frank Meraki, everybody knows who's a commercial fisherman as well as a MFAC member. But um, it's a great award and I'm glad we're, we're back on track uh, issuing it. And I would invite the, the commission members to, um, to uh, if they have any nominees to maybe submit them to us and we'll bring forward uh, you know, a memo uh, next month at the, uh, or, or whenever you want, Ray, uh, in, the, in the near term to try to uh, keep us on track and, and um, award the, uh, this, uh, this citation for 2023. Uh, I've already received one um, nomination and uh, that's another part of my, my story here. Uh, we went to the funeral for Mike Hickey, who was a 52 year um, shellfish uh, biologist uh, working for DMF. And he's, uh, he had an amazing career. Uh, he was so integral to the creation of the so-called model ordinance that, that which um, all the states are, are bound by working with FDA to make shellfish a safe product. Uh, in, especially in interstate commerce. And uh, Mike retired from DMF uh, just prior to the COVID uh, outbreak, uh, which meant uh, his, unfortunately, his uh, retirement party was canceled. And uh, it's, it was you know, too bad because Mike was very colorful and, and uh, it was a party that a lot of folks had looked forward to. And um, anyway, so one of the staff, Jeff Kennedy, who, who was Mike's successor, has uh, submitted a memo to me that I will share with you. Um, and as part of the, um, the one of as one of the nominations, and so uh, if anybody has has um, and and I'll send out a memo describing the award. So we do welcome um, you know other other nominees. So I look forward to that. Uh, comings and goings uh, again, staying on shellfish. Uh, Mike's successor, Jeff Kennedy, who is a forty year employee, uh, is retiring at the end of July. And, um, and as is a, a longtime uh, senior bacteriologist, uh, Diane Regan, who works up at the clam plant. So we've got some uh, key roles to fill up there. Uh, next is the derelict gear report presentation, which Bob Glenn is going to give today. I just wanna say how, how proud I am of Bob and his team and, and, and thank all the folks who contributed to this initiative, including law enforcement and the Center for Coastal Studies. Um, and uh, of course the Mass Lobstermen's Association to try to figure out a solution to this, uh, to this uh, ongoing, but it seems to be worsening uh, problem of marine debris, uh, especially uh, you know, uh, the wire traps that, that uh, can sometimes get damaged and abandoned and, and uh, are persistent, way more persistent than in the old days when uh, traps were made of, of, of uh, wood. And, um, and bricks, and, and now they're made of uh, plastic coated wire, which is way more persistent than marine environment. So we're trying to uh, come up with some solutions. One of the things that prevents us from doing that is the, the state laws are, are designed to protect 
old wooden lobster traps and uh, it's it's kind of out of date. So Bob's gonna give a presentation on that, but I, I, I can't tell you how pleased I am because uh, it is one of my priorities to try to solve that one. And then finally, uh, NOAA Fisheries is presenting uh, DMF with an award on July 25th at the Massachusetts State House. Uh, it's called a Partners in Conservation Award for our right whale conservation efforts. And I hope uh, some members of the commission can attend that because um, a lot of what they're recognizing us for is our regulatory scheme. And, um, and we couldn't do that without the support of the commission. And so that's uh, in the late afternoon on July 25th, uh, four o'clock, but I will give you more information on that uh, as we get closer. So that's my report for today. I'd be happy to take any questions, Mr. Chairman. Questions for Director Dan McKeon. Khalil? Khalil, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Director, uh, could you uh, give us a little bit of an update as to what has occurred any issues, developments regarding the horseshoe crabs um, since our last meeting in May? Sure. Um, obviously, there's been a lot of press coverage uh, and, and social media buzz, but uh, we have been monitoring the landings uh, as well. And it appears that we, we have some um, elevated landings in the month of May compared to previous years. Uh, we've been uh, chasing down at least uh, one dealer to make sure that they they're on time reporting. So, uh, and um, and we continue to to have some internal discussions. You know, when we make a change like we did regarding uh, creating a a biomedical quota, and and um, you know that that in itself, you know, kind of altered sort of the way that that some some folks approach the fishery where um, I think the, the bait crabs were were probably um, bled first. And so um, we have a little bit of a concern that there may not be uh, the same number of bait crabs available to the to the bait users later in the season if, if a lot of the bait quota was caught earlier than expected. And this is analogous to our Menhaden quota, where one of the actions you took last month was to uh, shift the Menhaden uh, season to a start date of, uh, I believe it's uh, June 15th, because we wanted to make the, the, the Menhaden product, which is a, a key bait product for lobstermen, we wanted to make that uh, available at a time when the demand was highest. So that may be something that we'll need to do uh, in the future, but you know, like like any fisheries management, uh, you know, activity, you uh, you have to adjust to uh, well, the industry adjusts, and then we have to adjust. So, you know, it's a uh, it's something we're watching um, carefully. As far as the regulations uh, it themselves, uh, they've been uh, submitted up the chain to um, to the uh, executive office of environmental affairs and ANF, and we're hopeful that uh, that those will be enacted imminently. They, they do require some review. And, um, you know, there was one other issue and it, it had to do with, uh, there was a report of some, some uh, dead crabs along the beaches, especially around uh, the south side of the Cape. And I know Bob Glenn has been working on that. So, so Bob, if you want to unmute yourself and maybe um, speak to the to what, what those findings were, what, what you guys have been doing regarding the, the reports of some dead crabs on the beach. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Um, yeah, over the last several weeks, we've had a few reports of dead horseshoe crabs. One the first was in the Hyannis area uh, that we cut. We looked into, canvassed the area a little bit, and it was only seemed to be isolated to just a few dozen crabs. Um, and then the more substantial one was uh, last week. I believe it was Thursday. Uh, we got a report from concerned citizen who was out walking the beach in Chatham. They also sent a, a video along with it and reported seeing several hundred or thousand or thousands of horseshoe crabs on the beach. Uh, DMF sent two biologists down there Friday morning to investigate the issue. Uh, Derek Perry and one of our other biologists um, walked about a mile and a half stretch of beach in which they counted around a little over 1,200 dead horseshoe crabs up on the beach. Um, 
There were no other signs of any other types of marine life like fish or other invertebrates washed up that would indicate that it was related to say a water quality or environmental issue. Um, they also kind of inspected the crabs fairly closely to look for signs of having been part of the biomed fishery as far as being bled. So they would either had been had had the biomed marking on them from the company that bled them, and or the telltale uh, kind of needle marks in the membrane, which Derek is you know accustomed to looking at. And you now the crabs didn't exhibit any signs of that. So these appear to be crabs that were part of the bait fishery. And then for, for some reason, um, possibly they were destined for the rent -a crab We're not really sure, but they, you know, they died and then were dumped somewhere off of Harding's Beach in Chatham and then came in with the tide. Um, that's as much as we know at this point. Uh, we're in the process of responding to, to several media inquiries about it. Thank you, Bob. You good, Khalil? I'm good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Khalil. Uh, Thank you, Director. And, and, and Mr. Glenn. Thank, thank you, Khalil. Mike Piernock's hand went up next. Michael, you're recognized. Mike, you're muted. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Director McKeeran. And uh, I just wanted to uh, update, uh, provide an update, and it does tie into, uh, as you mentioned, the vessel trackers and EVTRs for the lobster fleet. Um, and as a result of public comments that I have heard concerning proposed uh, rules for high, high, highly migratory species vessels that there's public comments coming up that are gonna require certain levels of monitoring and reporting and so on, um, of which uh, there was those from the Mid-Atlantic or farther south, which uh, had complaints about the different vessel tracking systems and different EVTR apps and how that would impact them financially and, and the need to have multiple systems or apps or so on uh, and, and the need for the one-stop shopping. So I, I just wanted to make all aware that those um, public meetings are coming up soon and the New England Fishery Management Council on the last day where there's a meeting at the end of the month, uh, we'll have a presentation by the highly migratory species group uh, detailing this. So just wanted to make everybody aware uh, because co commercially, whether they're lobster in or any other uh, vessel that may have multiple permits, how they may be impacted by uh, that decision or, or was it, well, it's public comment and ultimately the decision. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Go Amaru. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dan, uh, thank you for the report. I, I'm gonna jump back to horseshoe crabs for a second. I, I wanna offer a, uh, my idea or my theory as to why there was an increase in activity in the month of May uh, for the bait harvest fishery. I think it probably has something to do with uh, the considerable amount of discussion and talk and threat for the uh, fishery to be curtailed or shut down during that period of time. And that's the reaction that happens virtually every time you talk about limiting access to a, a resource. Uh, there tends to be a jump in the amount of activity to recover that resource before rules and regulations go into effect. So I don't think it's indicative of anything other than that one particular <clears throat> uh, conversation we were having at the time. But I'm also I'm quite distressed about this uh, large number of horseshoe crabs that were um, discovered on the beach <clears throat> and having the state come down and, and get an accurate tally is important. And I'm glad that they did that, even though it's, it's a, a very sad note. But I want to point out it's, a, it's an aberration in the overall process that's been conducted for the harvest of horseshoe crabs and the, re and the return to the water. I don't know what the reason was, and I hope there is a, a determining factor that will end up being discovered down the road. Uh, those those are my comments on those two topics. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Bill. And just to reiterate what Bob said, uh, we're we're convinced this is not a a result of blood crabs not surviving because we we obviously Derek, who who's very experienced in this, did look for signs that these animals were could have been blood, and they he didn't find any of them. So it's it's far it's much different than 
I think I think there's even some speculation in the media or whatever, or me, you know, me just generating on the public that it, that that's what it was. But we're confident that that's not the case. That's good. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Dan. Questions for Dan? Not seeing any further hands raised, Mr. Chair. I have one comment, Dan. Um, I'm proud of the fact that DMF spoke up at the Horseshoe Crab PDT TC meeting because there was thought about pushing the track assessment off to 26. And the gentleman from the Gloucester office spoke up and he pushed hard that we have that track assessment in 24. So, and being how this has become a hot button item, horseshoe crabs, I just wanted to thank DMF. Uh, I forget the gentleman's name. He's out of the Gloucester office, Bob, you might know, or Mike Armstrong might know the gentleman I'm talking about. He's on that PDT, TC, ASMFC. And he pushed hard for that 24 track assessment, which was voted up. So we will get a track assessment on horseshoe crabs in 2024. Hey, Ray, that would be uh, Derek Perry, and he's down here in our New Bedford office. Okay. All right. Well, uh, I was just, I was happy to hear that, you know, listening in on that. All right. Cheers. No, well right. done. Well done, Derek. Well done, Derek. Well done, DMF. Thank you very much. Any other questions or comments for Director McKeon? Not seeing any, Mr. Chair. Okay, we're moving on to the MFAC annual elections. Uh, Jared, you should run this. Sure. So um, there's there's three seats: the chairmanship, the vice chair, and the clerk. Um, I guess we'll start with with the chair, and um, you know, I'd be looking for a. I think you'd be looking for a motion, Ray, um, to for a, an appointment to that second and then a roll call vote for each. I'd like to make a motion. I'd like to right. nominate Ray Kane. I'll, I'll second, second that. Ray right. Bill Emmer with the motion to nominate Ray Kane, Bill Doyle with a second. Uh, that'll proceed to a roll call vote. Uh, Bill Emmer? Aye. Bill Doyle? Aye. Cleo Bogdan? Yes. Sookie Sawyer? Yes. Tim Brady? Yes. Lou Williams? Yes. Shelly Edmondson? Yes. Mike Peardnock? Yes. All right, Ray, uh, that passes unanimously. Ray's been reappointed chairman. Uh, same for vice chair. I'd be looking for a motion for vice chair. And make a motion to nominate Michael. I'll second it. All right, that's a motion by Bill Doyle to nominate Mike Piernock, seconded by Lou Williams. They'll proceed to a roll call vote. Bill Amaru? Yes. Bill Doyle? Yes. Khalil Bogdan? Yes. Sookie Sawyer? Yes. Tim Brady? Yes. Lou Williams? Yes. Shelly Edmondson? Yes. Mike Piernock? Mike's going to abstain for voting for himself. Stain. So. Uh, that's Dane. I'm sorry. <laughs> that's fine. So that's uh seven to one in favor. Or seven, seven in favor, two abstentions. Um, and then um, the same for clerk. For frame of reference, Bill Doyle is currently the clerk. Khalil here, I move Bill Doyle for that position. Second. All right, so that's a motion by Khalil for Bill Doyle, remain clerk, seconded by Bill Amaru. Proceed to a roll call vote. Bill Amaru? Yes. <clears throat> Khalil Bogdan? Yes. Uh, Sucky Sawyer? Yes. Tim Brady? Yes. Lou Williams? Yes. Khalil Bogdan? Well, you already called me. Oh, sorry. Mike Piernock? Yes. Shelly Edmondson? Yes. Uh, Bill Doyle, you'll abstain? Abstain. All right. So that passes as well with seven to other two abstentions. And uh, that concludes item four, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Jared.
Thank you, commission members. We can move along here now to action items, recreational step limits. Yes, so just as by way of background, each year we are forced to enact emergency regulations on uh, black sea bass scup and sometimes summer flounder though not this year and so um and the reason for that is that the timing of the enumeration of of catch and and, and discard and, and total removals uh doesn't happen until late in the year doesn't get um fully uh you know vetted and revealed to us until around february which means uh, we have uh, less than two to three months to get these on the books before fishing starts. So we're always forced to do these emergency actions. And we do our best to hold um, public uh, scoping meetings so that we can get the uh, feel for the uh, public's uh, interest in this. And furthermore, we, we bring it to the commission to you folks to um, give us guidance and in, in our own interpretation of that uh, because uh, if, if as we already enacted this as an emergency it would really be uh, completely useless if you as a commission came back and and um, and didn't support the final regulation so we do our best to um, get your consensus uh, and we did that i believe at the march um, meeting and so uh, this is kind of a, a pro forma action, but um, it is required, um, you know, uh, under our our uh, statutory and regulatory uh, requirements. So um, I will let uh, Jared. Do you want to take this or Nicola? The the actual details of of uh, of what we've enacted for this year. Nicola, you're recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Jared is just bringing up a slide of the rules, but they were contained in a, in a short memo to you. Um, as, as Dan said, we we brought a, you know kind of all the rationale for these rules forward to you in, in March um, and implemented them by emergency rule effective at the end of April. Um, so what we have here on the slide uh, provides a summary of, of what we are seeking your approval for for the 2023 recreational scup and black sea bass limits. Um, the changes from last year uh, for scup include a closure of January through April for all modes and increase in the minimum size by a half inch. Uh, for vessel-based modes, a decrease in the minimum size for shore-based modes or the shore-based mode, and a reduction in the four higher bonus season that occurs during May and June um, from 50 fish to 40 fish. Um, with black sea bass, the changes um, are is largely the, the half-inch size increase uh, with a commensurate adjustment to the season that adds uh, four days just to uh, maximize the allowed season. Um, for both species, we were subject to 10% um, reductions um, mandated under the interstate and federal fishery management plans. For SCUP, we worked within our region, our northern region, to have um, largely uniform regulations, the only difference being the timing of when that um, for higher bonus season occurs. So collectively, the states of, of Massachusetts through New York are making these changes and achieving the 10% reduction. Um, and with black sea bass, each state um, goes through its the process itself and needed to take a 10% reduction. Um, we had uh, a lot of comment at, at our scoping meeting and some good discussion at the, at the March commission meeting when, where we reviewed these. Um, we did then subsequently hold uh, the official public comment period. Uh, we didn't receive any comments at that point. Um, you know, an indication of the fact that the, the rules are already in place, the, the, the seasons are, are now open. Um, so we're just looking to continue to move forward these for final rulemaking for this year. So my question to you, Nicholas, do we want to take uh, these in separate actions, motions or combine? Stop and black sea bass in one motion. How does what's the thoughts of DMF on this? Jared, do you have any preference? I, I would think that one motion for both would be okay to accept the director's recommended uh, recommendation yeah, for final rulemaking. There's going to be um, substantial debate on each item. I, I, I'd assume um, we can we can move this as one motion. 
Okay, so let, let's get the motion on the floor and then we can have a discussion. If there is, if there needs to be a discussion. So I need a motion, ladies and gentlemen. Well, here I moved the recreational stuff in Black Sea Bash Limit as presented. Need a second. Second. Thank you, Khalil. Thank you. Suki. Suki with the second. Yes, yeah, Suki was the second. Thank you, Suki. And the roll call vote, Jared. Um, we will. Do you want to enter and take debate comments? Yeah. yeah, we can have a discussion, debate, whatever. It's open. The floor is open for discussion. Mike Beardnock. Michael, you recognize. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I think my comments uh, were really captured in the last meeting or in the meeting minutes. And it, it's just to pass on what uh, many from the public have uh, contacted me concerning um, the significant reduction in bookings this year between the weather and the continued cuts the seasons and bag limits for black sea bass, scup, cod, and the recent revisions to straight bass. As, as one looks at Massachusetts and then looks at other states such as New Jersey, where they have a much more favorable bag limit for black sea bass, the, the clientele are saying, we're going there, we're not coming up here. And they have felt the they're feeling the sting significantly. Um, I, I wanna just make sure all are aware of that. Um, it's unfortunate. Um, I think that based on what needs to be done here and it's an emergency, I, I reluctantly will, uh, go with it, but just want to make, um, all aware of the status of how this is impacting those from the four hire fleet, as well as the, the, the blue economy and hope that there's some answers in the future with relief, which I, uh, thank Director McKiernan for uh, his attempts to try to get the Mid-Atlantic to consider changes to SCUP and uh, moving commercial uh, quota over to the REC and whether that'll even move forward or possibly for these other species to, to help, uh, it, it's not clear at this point, but um, uh, that's it, thank you. Thank you, Michael. Bill Amaru. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So notwithstanding the excellent comments Mike just made, I, I want to say something about black sea bass. I've been going fishing for black sea bass in Nantucket Sound this past couple of weeks. And I'm certainly extremely proud of the uh, result of the conservation efforts that we've made on black sea bass because the population out there right now is just fantastic. And the, the numbers of fish uh, are reflected through the entire range of sizes. We're catching fish of all sizes. And, some really good sized fish as well. So my, my comment is uh, the weather in September is usually very, very nice. It's a placid month, notwithstanding there are occasional hurricanes that do pass through, but for the most part, we have beautiful weather. And to have the season for these fish for recreational purposes close on September 7th with four fish limit 16 and a half inches just seems to be a shame for the, for the fishing public. And uh, somehow I hope in the future, uh, as uh, some of these issues of equality are, are leveled off, we can see that season go at least until the second or third week of September. Those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Khalil. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm, I'm just, um, I would like to uh, just get some clarification from what Bill said. Why? why and maybe Nicola, this is for you. Why was why what was the reasoning for the September 7th closing? Or that no, let me back up. What was the reason for May 20 to September 7th? What what is the logic or the reasoning behind that? Nicola? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, well the so that the change from last year is is very minor, but we've been kind of stuck with a, a mid-May to early September closure for a number of years. Um, and we and we got to that shorter season by 
um, a number of years where we needed to take cuts and <clears throat> we did so through the bag limit sometimes we did through did so through the seasons at, at sometimes and um, each state has been doing this, you know, individually. So that's where you get a, a difference in season length and bag limit in some places. I think I'd be remiss if I didn't point out that New Jersey only has a one fish bag limit during all of July and August, and that's where they achieve part of their reduction. So that's just an example of how states have um, achieved their reductions differently over the years and where you get some, some differences in the, in the season and the bag limit among the states. Um, but looking ahead, the the hope would be that you know we can be in a position to liberalize for the first time in many years for sea bass with um, you know favorable stock. Um, but we we continue to have harvest that is at the recreational harvest limit coastwide or exceeding it um, for a number of years, and that's why we've been in a position of needing to take cuts. Thank you, Nicola. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Dan McKiernan, you've got your hand up. Yeah, I'd like to pile on uh, with Nicola on an issue here. Uh, Nicola's right. It's one fish for anglers in New Jersey during July and August, but it's zero fish in the month of September. So, um, you know, this is, we, we've, real, we've been nervous about uh, enacting those kind of convoluted uh, rules in season. I do confess that we have those kind of rules in um, for Tatog, but at least we don't have any closed periods for Tatog, uh, like where where you know a tourist angler might be out fishing and and retain a fish and not even realize that the that particular day uh, is is a is a no fishing day or that month is a no fishing month. So this is challenging, you know. And and I've worked with Nickler on this for many years, and the sort of the the backstory to some of this is that. You know, going back about, I don't know, Nick, maybe 10 years when um, when we first started going down this road of these regional measures, um, we kind of got locked into a proportional pie share of the recreational catch among our state neighbors all, all between New York and, uh, and, and us, uh, you know, New York, Connecticut, uh, Rhode Island, et cetera. And, um, and as a result, uh, we haven't been able to break out of that. And so even though fish, uh, you know, are moving here, uh, we know that with the commercial quotas, we've gotten more. Uh, we really haven't made that same kind of um, inroad into a, a better high share of the recreational sea bass um, uh, allowance. So it is something that that Nicola and I have brought up to our our. Um, uh, partners in the other states, uh, reminding them that, yeah, that was then, this is now, it still kind of feels unfair, especially with Connecticut, I believe they don't even close their fishery in the fall. Um, so we're really sensitive to this. And, um, and it is, you know, it is a, a priority for me to, to try to get a better shake on the on the recreational uh, fishery for black sea bass. If I could add, add on a little bit too, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, cool. Thank you. Um, I just I, I did want to note that we have brought forward proposals in the past or options for comment that did include extending the season in the fall, but it would come at the expense of uh, shortening the season on the front end, and that generally has not been favored. Um, for this year, we also looked at some options that would have gone to a lower bag limit, one or two fish in order to get that season length, but um, you know that that wasn't favored in the public comment that we received as well. Um, so we're we're trying to balance with these rules the the different um, different needs among among the fishery. For the, you know you, people want the early season, they want the fall, and and uh, and a high bag limit, and it's 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 very difficult to to achieve all of those things at once. Thank you, Nicola. Yes, we've been going round and round with this for years. And as you said, they don't want to give up the front end, but by giving up one or two days on the front end, you'd have that many more days on the back end. I don't know, what is it? Seven to one or something. So, but that's the reason Khalil and Nicola and DMF staff have been diligent. They've been working on this for years on, you know, with the joint committee, with the Mid-Atlantic and uh, my hat's off to Nicola for her efforts. And I guess we all saw that email or letter that was submitted to Mike Patney. That was your handicraft, wasn't it, Nicola? 
the the black sea bass commercial comment letter yeah or this I, or that there was a there's a a letter about transferring quota between the sectors as well but but yes uh, those were efforts from the management and policy staff yeah very good thank you uh more questions on this or discussion not seeing any further hands raised. Oh, Michael. Mike. Nice. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Nicola. What, um, just just so I can uh, schedule it appropriately, the Mid Atlantic uh, has is supposed to have on the agenda to address the scup issue uh, for transfers recreationally and commercially, or so on. Is that upcoming, or is that in August? Uh, my understanding at this time is that that is likely to be on the August Mid-Atlantic Council meeting agenda when they meet jointly with the ASMFC. Okay. All right. Thank for you. A, for, for a, for a, you know, a preliminary discussion. And if something yeah. were to happen, then it would be another, you know, two meetings or, or more to, to work on that. But there, there are a lot of, a lot of things in the air with these species right now. Um, in terms of the whole recreational reform initiative, I think the re developing and replacing the harvest control rule within within two or three years when it sunsets is is the priority. Um, there's also a an alloc, you know, a, a sector separation amendment that was initiated several years ago and really has not been launched yet because of all these other um, ongoing efforts as well. Well, thank you. Thank you, Michael. Dan, your hands up. Yeah, Nicole, I just want you to clarify um, the initiative at the Mid Atlantic Council. It would be for commercial quota to be transferred to the rec sector. It wouldn't be an individual state that could move its commercial quota to its recreational fishery, right? Correct. This would be done be on a, a regional level, yeah, or a, a coastwide level, um, yeah. akin to in years prior. There's been transfers for bluefish of of recreational to commercial quota. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Your hands still up. No, I'm good. Thank you. Thank you. There's no further discussion or debate. Is this a roll call vote, Jared? That's correct, Mr. Chair. Would you like me to call the roll? Please do. Bill Amaru? Yes. Khalil Bogdan? Yes. Bill Doyle? Yes. Williams? Yes. Suki Sawyer? Yes. Mike Beardenock? Yes. Tim Brady? Yes. Shelly Edmondson. Yes. Motion carries unanimously, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Commission members. Moving on, the letter to former Division of Fishing Game Commissioner Ron Amadin. Garrett. One moment, Mr. Chair. All right, uh, at your request, Mr. Chair, we put together a um, a letter uh, to former Commissioner Ron Amadon uh, from the commission. Uh, this was distributed in the commission's June materials uh, and it primarily thanks uh, the commissioner for his, his work and uh, provides him with some credit for some of the significant things he did both with regards to the commission and the division. Um, so um, I would take any Questions, comments, amendments to this to this letter now, and then we could uh, vote up a final uh, letter here and send that off to Ron this afternoon. Well, Jared's open the floor up to commission members. Any thoughts on the letter? I believe we received it in the packet, so we yeah. recognize. Yeah. Yes, just move it along. Uh, I thought the letter was well done and it, and it, it um, really highlighted what uh, commissioner, ex-commissioner, past commissioner, uh, Ron Amadon has accomplished. And um, so if there were no more 
comments after mine well we could move it and then we could have some further discussion i, I would move that we accept this letter and, and send it off to uh ron amadon thank you Khalil. i need a second i'll take it thank you shelly uh any further discussion not seeing any hands raised mr chair and this is another roll call vote um, yeah. this isn't uh, we can take it as a roll call vote this isn't enacting anything so i mean it's it's informal to that regard so we could do it by unanimous consent if you prefer yeah why don't we just do it by consensus as a okay. vote? Roll so if there are any objections raise your hand I'm not seeing any objections, Mr. Chair. I will get this uh, letter out to Commissioner Amadon later tonight. Thank you, Commission members. Thank you, Jared. Moving along, discussion items, Federal Fisheries Management Update. Melanie Griffin, floor is yours. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, Jared has a few slides that I will run through that detail a few decisions and discussions from the council's April meeting, since I haven't uh, updated you in a while. And I'll provide a few highlights of what's on tap for the upcoming June council meeting. Uh, of course, the, the biggest news uh, right now is the appointment of Dr. Kate O'Keefe as the next executive director of the New England Fishery Management Council. Um, you know, serving on that search committee was <laughs> both a lengthy and compressed timeline, but I think it was ultimately a successful process and uh, led up to the full council's vote uh, about two weeks ago. So Dr. O'Keefe will start, I think her official start date is July 17th, but she'll be at the June council meeting in Freeport, Maine. And that will be the last council meeting for our current executive director, Tom Neese. So looking forward to Dr. O'Keefe's leadership. Uh, next slide, Jared. So uh, in terms of habitat at the council, uh, the Northern Edge Scallop Access goal and objectives were approved. The council initiated uh, this framework to consider scallop fishery access to the Northern Edge uh, Habitat Management Area or HMA on Georgia's Bank. Um, the goal is uh, for access in the 2025 fishing year. And, um, the council unanimously adopted the framework's goal, which is to uh, develop a rotational harvest program within and or around the closed area to habitat closure that avoids habitats important to juvenile cod, minimizes adverse effects to essential habitats, minimizes adverse biological and economic impacts to other managed fisheries, and contributes to optimum yield for the scallop fishery. And that's accompanied by seven objectives. Um, so there's gonna be plenty of work to try and achieve that goal and objective. There've been, um, let's see, June 6th, there was a joint habitat and scallop PDT meeting, and that'll help advance the next phase of work by the committees and the council. So I'll keep you posted as things move along there. And then in terms of the salmon aquaculture framework, the council took final action on that to authorize possession of farm-raised Atlantic salmon in federal waters. Uh, possession is going to be allowed via a letter of authorization that's going to be issued by NOAA Fisheries uh, and requires stowage of fishing gear. Um, that is uh, That was a unanimous preferred alternative. Next slide. Monkfish, the council has formed a research set aside awesome. program review work group, and that's being chaired by our own Kelly Whitmore. It has a, a few short months to recommend changes to the council that may help uh, improve utilization of the RSA program, but it sounds like they're, they're already making some strides. I know she had a recent meeting uh, last week or two. So the current timeline is to report out to the council in September. Uh, and we'll keep you posted. If you have any questions or want to talk about it, give give Kelly a call. Next slide. Groundfish. Um, I'm sure most of you know this by now, given this is back in April, but the council voted to request an emergency action by NOAA Fisheries 
uh, to address catch limits for Gulf of Maine haddock for this uh, 2023 fishing year. And specifically, the council indicated a, uh, a higher risk tolerance of setting an ABC at 90% of FMSY. This stock is recently experiencing overfishing, but was assessed as last having a spawning stock biomass that was equal to 270% of its target. That was in 2021. So the council, um, well, uh, I think it was a 16-1-0 vote with uh, the regional administrator uh, opposed, which is just um, kind of the rigor thing with these emergency action requests. Uh, if NIMS agrees, this would result in a 345 metric ton increase above the current uh, ABC that was approved in framework 65. Um, and that was 1,936 metric tons. So about 345 metric tons over that. We'll see what NIMS approves, um, but of course nothing's going to be a complete solution in, in this case. It's a very limiting quota. Uh, the council will, follow up by possibly reprioritizing its groundfish workload uh, to revise 2024 and 2025 ABCs for Gulf of Maine haddock, but there's going to be no new assessment information next year. So, you know, that biomass information that I referred to, that 270% uh, will be that much more dated. Um, and any information that we have on the 2020 year class strength will have to come directly from fishery dependent and independent sources. So I'm not certain you know, where the council will be as far as its risk tolerance for those further out years. Um, uh, so that'll, that'll come up in September for our priority discussion. And then um, a little bit farther into the future, the council is also recommending to the Northeast Fishery Science Center and the Northeast Regional Coordinating uh, Council that Gulf of Maine Haddock be included as a case study in the state space model research track assessment that's scheduled for a peer review in mid-November. So otherwise the ground, council's ground fish discussion touched on continuing the work plan for revising the ground fish ABC control rule. Uh, final action on that is expected in April, 2024. And working uh, the work plan for the council's transition to new Atlantic cod stock structure. Um, mainly, that means the order of topics to be discussed by the council um, was altered somewhat. So, uh, we'll be talking about spawning and allocation issues and unit management criteria. Uh, this has all kind of been dynamic because of ongoing delays to the research track that will finalize on the science side of things, the, the final COD stock structure. So next slide. The risk policy working group. Uh, this is related, of course, to review of the groundfish ABC control rules, uh, but it is a separate um, policy, a more overarching policy, and it's a separate uh, work group for the council. So the council did approve terms of reference for this group and in broad strokes that includes uh, basically conducting a review of the policy and then providing recommendations. So the importance of transparency and clearly communicating uh, has been highlighted by a lot of the working group members. Uh, we met recently uh, last week, I think it was June 8th, to continue consideration of changes to the existing policy. And it's been an encouraging discussion so far. Um, work is going to proceed incrementally. So the work group will provide uh, periodic updates to the council along the way. And you can, of course, if you're interested, follow along as analyses are developed and the working group kind of deepens its discussions. There is a dedicated web page to the work group on the council's website. Uh, the goal is to wrap up work in the next 12 to 18 months with recommendations from the group presented to the full council. Uh, and as I've somewhat inferred, I'm, I am serving on that group. So if anyone would like to talk about any particular issues in greater depth, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Uh, next slide. Atlantic Herring, uh, the council prioritized revisiting that inshore midwater trawl closure that was previously adopted in amendment eight but that was uh, vacated soon after by uh, court order. So to provide clear guidance on that priority, the council 
unanimously agreed to commit uh, this draft problem statement that you see here back to the Heron Committee uh, for further refinement uh, with the intent of approving it at its June meeting. So the council also remanded a reprioritization discussion. We have a policy when, when priorities change mid-year uh, that requires committee approval and then coming back to the council. Uh, and so the council has asked uh, for that discussion about whether work this year should include analyzing and identifying a range of time area closures to avoid and minimize catch of river herring and shad in midwater trawl and small mesh bottom trawl fisheries. So that discussion will take place at the committee at its June 22nd um, meeting, and then we'll go to the council. And if I recall correctly, the policy requires a two thirds vote by the council to change priority mid-year. Um, next slide. So protected, uh, resources, there is a specific priority related to Atlantic sturgeon, where the council is working jointly with the Mid-Atlantic to reduce sturgeon bycatch in federal large mesh gillnet fisheries. This involves action in the monkfish and spiny dogfish fisheries, so Kelly and Nick are involved on that. Uh, it's guided by recommendations from NOAA's Sturgeon Action Plan and um, to lay the groundwork, the councils have initiated framework 15, but it's hit a bit of a snag uh, in the recent weeks and it's likely going to delay final approval beyond uh, the current uh, scheduled uh, action of December. So what's happened is that the gillnet fishery has exceeded its allowed take uh, under the existing 2021 biop, which is going to trigger a review or renewal of that biop and uh, basically, there's been a notable increase, not just in the take, but mortality from uh, gillnet gear, not for trawl gear. Uh, so in, this is going to delay final council action probably uh, for, for both, uh, you know, since this is a coordinated action, it's, it's probably going to be like February, April um, between the two councils. Uh, but it also um, is impacting how the committees are proceeding. So. Uh, while we've talked about a range of alternatives, there's probably not going to be any uh, immediate uh, desire to try to winnow that range of alternatives, which is kind of the step that we were at right now. Basically, the, the, the current focus on just large mesh may no longer be warranted. Uh, I know the BIOP is going to pull in all, all the, the mesh sizes. So the good news is we likely have the full range of, of tools we need to consider in terms of time area alternatives, gear modifications, and being more inclusive of all, all mesh sizes. Just the bad news is that this is going to take a little longer. Next slide. On-demand fishing gear conflict working group. I just threw this up here because the council has put this together. The working group, uh, its aim is to identify and address interactions between on-demand gear and other fishing gear types, including those used by uh, mobile, fixed, and recreational charter fleets. So I just wanted to um, flag this since the membership has been announced um, and the work plan was just finalized. Dave McCarran is the council staff coordinator and uh, the group should have its first meeting in early summer. Uh, that'll be posted on the council's calendar so you can always uh, check there for when that is. Next slide. Council is also discussing development of a thorny skate rebuilding white paper and plan uh, for the upcoming skate fishery specifications, which covers the next two fishing years. Uh, we should be getting some updates on that in June. Uh, otherwise, not much else to report at this point. Next slide. So the June council meeting outlook, this is up in Freeport, Maine. As I mentioned, this is gonna be the last for our current executive director. Um, most actions will be under development in June. So we'll be receiving a, a bunch of updates on the Northern edge, on herring inshore midwater trawl closure, and uh, that white paper I just mentioned for Thorny Skate. Uh, we'll also be initiating a few routine actions, uh, namely specifications, packages for ground fish, uh, that's framework 66, which will cover 2024 and 20, through 2026, uh, depending on the stock. Uh, scallop specs for 2024 with default for 2025. And then, uh, as I mentioned, skate specs for the next two years. 
and uh, just noted a few of the upcoming committee meetings going into the June council meeting. So we've got skates and scallops and groundfish and herring. If you uh, want to reach out to talk about any of the issues for those committee meetings, uh, Kelly serves on the skate committee and I serve on the scallop, groundfish and herring. So happy to talk, talk through any of that. Next slide. Just a few other regional updates that I thought uh, might be interesting. I, I did um, brief you guys a little bit about this uh, Supreme Court uh, case that's been taken up. Uh, it's the Loper Bright uh, challenge, which has to do with the herring industry funded monitoring, but actually the, the real um, challenge here that a lot of people are focusing on is that Chevron challenge of uh, federal deference and federal agencies. Um, it's likely to be heard. So the SCOTUS has, or excuse me, the Supreme Court has decided to take that up. It's likely to be heard in their new term that starts October 1st with a ruling early in 2024. I would stay tuned for any amicus filings, particularly on the side of the federal government. There's already quite a few that have joined on the proponent side early on. So that's all, all evolving. Um, and I think pretty, pretty interesting. Um, Next slide. There are unfortunately some pretty concerning delays that I'm sure most of you are aware of out of the Northeast Fisheries Science Center. I uh, just got some more updates at uh, yesterday's XCOM meeting, and these are affecting all, all the surveys right now, both the spring bottom trawl survey on the Bigelow and the scallop surveys that are on the Sharp. And for the bottom trawl survey, um, you know, it was originally scheduled to sail on March 15th, but was delayed numerous times due to scheduled maintenance and unforeseen repair issues. It's resulted in the loss of the entire first leg, which covers from Hudson Canyon to Cape Hatteras. Um, you know, uh, the center's approach to, to triaging this is basically decreasing the surface area, uh, survey area by not sampling southern strata and decreasing survey coverage through the remainder of the survey area. Uh, more specifically to try and achieve 70% of the planned coverage in Southern New England, Georgia's Bank and Gulf of Maine. Uh, reductions are, are going to be spread throughout all the strata, but not equally. Um, so if you have questions or concerns there, I know Mike Simpkins, uh, a lot of this is dynamic and ongoing, um, or you, you, know, you can talk, talk to me and I can try to get you answers. Uh, <laughs> Perhaps, uh, well, I'll just say more dynamic of late is the scallop uh, federal survey situation, which seems to have gone from bad to worse. Uh, it's also suffered from numerous delays, uh, first due to limited sea days of borrowed the RV Sharp, which is leased out from the University of Delaware. And the survey was initially going to be compressed from a survey that in 2022 was over 29 days and three legs to two 11 day cruises this year. That was, the, that was the initial response to the initial delay. Um, and to fit that substantial change, um, the number of target dredge stations across Georgia's bank and number of initial HABCAM transects were reduced. So this really left minimal room for error uh, or lost sea time, or I should say for further error or, or lost sea time. And unfortunately, that's where we find ourselves right now. The, the SHARP was reportedly conducting sea trials yesterday after it got the, por the parts that it needed. And that leaves just seven days for survey work. Um, that's still a best case scenario. So the plan I believe is June 14th to 21st. Uh, the Science Center is continuing to try, triage its cruise plan. Uh, we're waiting on updates about whether any optical work will take place aboard the SHARP. Um, they have to do both the dredge and, and have cam work there and what areas will be prioritized. It's, it's my hey, understanding- Excuse me, Melanie? Yeah. Only, uh, at the beginning of the meeting, the chairman asked for a hard stop at 10.15. No problem. I'll 15 pause minutes. Right so here. if you could yeah. just pause here and yep. we'll, we're going to resume at 10.15. Uh, Bill, I see your hand is up, but can it wait till we resume at 10.30? Yes, because it's going to take a little while. Okay, yeah. good. Okay. <laughs> so, right. So sorry about that, Melanie, but we'll, we'll no, no be worries. back at 10.30. Okay. okay. So Jerry, could you put something on the screen? Is Ray on? I do so, not have Ray back yet. Yeah, so okay. go ahead. All right, so Melanie, you have the floor. Thank you. 
Thanks, Mike. Um, so uh, I was summarizing uh, the federal scallop survey being truncated down to a seven day cruise uh, that hopefully will be on the water tomorrow. Um, so part of the filling of the gap is working. I mean, the thing that we benefit with in scallops is that uh, obviously the federal survey is just one of many because the RSA program allows for some partners that conduct both optical and dredge surveys. So it's my understanding that at least one RSA survey partner will be able to fill some of the gaps in the mid-Atlantic, but we're still waiting to hear what can be done by partners to fill the void on Georgia's bank. So like VIMS with their dredge survey and SMAS with their drop camera survey, uh, whether they could add on some additional work, but that would you know, have to come after their work that they're already doing. So you're talking about in July. Um, unfortunately, the, the plan B that the Science Center had to also tag on some HABCAM work later in the season aboard the Bigelow is now in question too. Uh, due to some mechanical issues with the A-frame. So, you know, regardless of what is pulled off in terms of the federal optical and dredge survey, um, you know, it remains to be seen how biomass estimates that likely won't be available until September, you know, might disrupt or delay the timing of specs that each year are already on a nice edge of timeliness. So, you know, some may recall that last year we just avoided a pretty chaotic start of the fishing year under default measures due to some bureaucratic delays outside of the region. Um, I'll say that there was a pretty lengthy discussion at the council's executive committee meeting yesterday about, you know, not just improving the communication out of the center, but about you know, pulling in its council partner and staff earlier into solution discussions um, and beyond just the triaging of these spring and summer surveys, discussion also look to kind of re-engage on what might be a more effective process and venue for revisioning survey work. You know, there's been times where we've touched down on integrating more industry-based survey work. It's not really gone anywhere at this time. Uh, or as of yet, um, but I know that there's renewed interest in that. And then I just have one more slide um, and then uh, I'll be wrapped up and happy to take any questions. So hot off the presses uh, is yesterday's release from the Council Coordination Committee or CCC. That's that body that is made up of all the eight regional councils um, and its report synthesizing conservation areas in federal waters of the United States. Now. If you recall, this work was developed in response to the Biden administration's America the Beautiful initiative, which uh, aims to conserve 30% of U.S. lands and waters by 2030. And to help measure progress towards achieving that goal, uh, the federal agencies are working on an atlas of conservation areas. So this report from the CCC's or CCC helps uh, to ID conservation areas that in the opinion of the councils should be included in that atlas. The work was done by an area-based management subcommittee that was led by the New England Council Chair, Eric Reed. Um, and uh, just to underscore that while areas identified by the Council Coordination Committee were, were identified against some pretty rigorous criteria for defining a conservation area that were based on both uh, international standards for conservation and some principles out of that America the Beautiful initiative. You know, the ultimate decision for what is included in the atlas lies with NOAA and other federal agencies involved in that. But, uh, you know, over 72% of, of federal waters were classified as conservation areas. And uh, I threw up uh, the website where you can download the report, but there's also, uh, I haven't had time to play around with it since it came out yesterday, but this, I tried to take a little uh, screenshot of an interactive dashboard, which looks like you can play around with um, region specific areas uh, to get a, a, a more detailed picture of what's included there. So next slide. And as promised, that, that pretty much wraps it up for the updates and I can take any questions. Um, Mr. Chair. Bill Amaru. Bill, you're muted. 
Yes, thank you. I'm sorry. Yes, very thorough and uh, important report. Uh, one of the best you've given so far, but because of the questions being um, uh, that we need to ask about what we're talking about. And it, it, sadly, it's been 25 years since I was on the council and the exact same problems uh, about surveys uh, are rising up from the depths again. Um, it seems as little has changed when it comes to the uh, the sad history, at least I think it is, of, of the uh, inability of the fishery service to put together meaningful surveys that, that in, include the industry and the information that we can help support and supply. Um, you did say that there is an effort, uh, again, to try and bring closer to the, uh, to the working aspects of survey work by NOAA uh, from the fishing industry itself. And it's, it's a question that's been asked and we've been trying for many years to get on board. And I know there's a new organization, an industry organization that you may, you may be able to help us understand a little bit. It's been organized by uh, uh, one of the more accurate fishermen I believe he's from Portland, Maine. He fishes out of New Bedford on uh, Teresa Marie, I think it is. Does that, uh, do you recall hearing about that? I do, Bill, and I know, yeah. I know he wrote an opinion piece in the right. latest National Fisherman that was specifically focused on the trawl survey and, and right. beyond what I mentioned, um, you know, I, I was negligent and not mentioning the issues too with, um, you know, no, no night toes. Um, right, and that's another point I have it written yeah. down here to mention. We, we can't, give up night towing and expect our survey results to be anywhere near accurate. It's been, it's been proven and anyone who's spent any time with, the, with, the, uh, with a, a trawl in the oceans of the world knows that the difference between nighttime and daytime is extremely significant and what kind of results you're gonna turn up. So, uh, especially for certain species of the flounder and others as well, uh, that has got to be added back in, and I don't understand what in the world was in their heads when they decided they were no longer going to make night sampling. But there's something wrong with that picture. And, and of course, the breakdowns in, in the history of the Bigelow and some of the other more modern vessels ever since the Bigelow came into port and was unable to get to its berth in, more, in Woods Hole and had to be repositioned Newport. It seems like it's been a, a legacy of, of one mistake after another that's being made. And the impacts of the information that's being generated is so critical to the health of the industry. And I, I'm not complaining about the, the money that the scallopers and some of the groundfish boats have been able to make in, in the recent decades. But uh, these, are, these are threats that at this point are, are becoming so serious as to undermine the, the viability of our New England fishing fleets. Because if this information isn't more timely and accurate, we're gonna be putting people on the beach that don't need to be there. It's as much as 80% of the quotas that are established don't get caught anymore in certain species and stocks. Uh, there's something wrong. There's a tremendous mismatch right now for what's going on. And, and uh, there has to be a, a, a careful analysis. The industry has got to be brought back on board. There are plenty of people out there who are scientists in their own right who fish for a living and could be tremendous assets to, to gathering information and bringing uh, you know the two parties to the table to work together. So anyway, those are those are my major comments, and, and I'm going to put a little more emphasis on the night aspect of doing trawl fishing for uh, for research. I, I I don't know how many people in in the, in the commission or in New England in general know that uh, our surveys have always uh, been for 24 hour periods during the time that the vessels were out between moving from station to station, toes at night and toes at day have always been um, an important part of the survey and, and they need to continue to be. So thanks again for um, a very thorough and, and uh, accurate report. Let's hope that the next couple of years starts to show some changes in where we position ourselves. Lou Williams? Jared, I, I can't see uh, the raised hands. Any other questions? Lou Williams? Yeah, thanks, Jared. Yeah, more of a comment. Really disappointed when I see that they're trying to uh, fill in the Minute Atlantic when uh, I've got friends of mine down there telling me in Del Mar area and they're getting all dead scholars. That would, you would think that would be a huge concern rather than just to um, say, oh, we're going to try to get somebody down there. Uh, with everything else going on in the Mid-Atlantic now with mammals and everything else, and now we got dead scallops down there. 
I'm um, sorry, but I, it seems weird that they're just not going to be doing any surveys there when a year of probably most critical to see what the hell is going on down there. So, but uh, I think that's very problematic and uh, it doesn't sit well with me. So, thanks. Yeah, thanks, Lou. And, and just so I, if I misspoke, uh, there will be coverage in the Mid Atlantic. I know, um, I think it's Kunamesset Farm that is surveying that area, RSA, and they uh, indicated uh, that they would be able to, not quite that Del Marva, but down at least Elephant Trunk uh, area. Um, uh, and, and like I said, we'll see what happens on Georgia's Bank with VIMS and, and SMAS. Let's see, there's, there, there, there goes my tinfoil hat. It's like they can go down there when they're not going to get to the Del Mar area and then they're showing dead scallops everywhere. Yeah. You know what I mean? That to me is very problematic. And um, I think it's a real, real issue. And, and and what Bill said too about the night surveys, I never knew that. That's crazy. You know, a lot of times, it's, you know, the night fishing. Is uh, all, you know, the, I remember the boats in Gloucester. A lot of times they just go fish at night because that's where the fish were down on the bottom, and uh, to eliminate them, I don't know. This whole yeah, there's a whole big problem with our research. No, no doubt about it. You know, with these giant cuts on haddock and everything else, it's kind of getting crazy. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, we'll see no, what happens. You. you know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, we'll those see what happens. Yeah, those night toes. I mean, the I, what my understanding is that basically it's just going to increase the uncertainty right now uh and, you know we, we definitely don't need more uncertainty when we're we're dealing with management decisions um and at least for the near term you know it calls into question some of the level one reports which are those dec direct reports um if if that's going to increase uncertainty so um hear you a lot include and agree agree on much of this yeah so okay thank you leo leo your hands raised Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just a just a comment. I you know it's a what, what Melanie presented. It's it's all very complicated, and the thought that goes into it, is the uh, the study and the putting all the information together is is really amazing. Um, as a commission member, and uh, and as a member of the general public, uh, I would really find it interesting if we could have a future discussion item on the modern trawling trawler business, uh, the, the draggers, the trawlers. Um, I, I have very little, you know, insider information on this type of fishing. You know, lots of times the public comes up with generalized statements that they do this, they do that to the environment, they do this at the bottom. I would really like to see, if it's possible, if we can get an update on uh, what, what, is, what, is, what is the trawling industry. How, how is it done? Uh, we don't, it doesn't have to be, you know, very much in depth, but at least give give us a general idea of um, what it takes to do a trawl, and you know, and what they're after, and then regarding bycatch and the size of the nets. I think it would be very informative uh, to have a discussion at a future uh, Marine Fisheries Advisory, Advisory Commission meeting. Thank you. Uh, I would suggest something. I, I don't know if Jared could put it together for you, Khalil, but that you take the MREP, you go for an MREP course. Jared, can you comment on that? Well, well, Ray, let me comment. Um, I think what, what Khalil is thinking is um, kind of like, like a trawling 101, you know, to understand the technology and also a kind of state of affairs of the of the trawler trawling industry, which I think are are both would be pretty useful. Um, so I can definitely put a couple of staff uh, on that um, you know, for a future meeting. Sure. Yeah, you know, oh, excuse me for jumping out. Uh, Director Pierce, at one time, we started this discussion back in my early days of um, on the commission, um, I, I think my second year or third year, um, in my first term, three-year term, and we started that. And then, it, you know, with business going on and and other items coming up, we really didn't get very far with it. But we did start that discussion. I think it would be interesting. A lot of lots of times, there's a lot of misconceptions with the general public as to uh, what what the what the trawlers do and how they do it and their impact on the environment. I think if we can get a 
a um, up-to-date modern look at just how they do their business, whether it's daylight or, or at night, uh, as Bill was talking about, I think it would be very informative, uh, not only to me, but maybe to some of the other commission members who don't have this kind of background, and also to anybody who might be listening in uh, on, the, on a commission meeting. Thank you, Khalil. Thank you, Mr. So, Chairman. So, Dan, you're going to put something together? Yeah, let me meet with staff and get back to you, Ray, and, and Khalil with some ideas for a future meeting. Ray? Questions for Melanie? Michael Peard, not. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just a question, Melanie. Uh, from what I recall at the last council meeting, there was discussions about uh, considering privatizing the Bigelow and the Albatross and privatizing that type of survey vessel and then manning it with NOAA um, staff. Is, is that something that's going to be considered or is that something that uh is in the works uh, i'm just curious because i was under the impression that that was brought up and was under consideration uh you know i don't have insights into uh too too much of what the you know this is this is the science center's enterprise uh the survey group uh, certainly part of the problem with the SHARP is that that is a University of Delaware vessel. And so, you know, even the, the, it, there was no chance to expand in time because the lease days had a window and then the SHARP has, has other stuff going on. And it's actually true of the Bigelow too, which it is a NOAA ship that, um, you know, there's so many other things going on that it, it's hard, which hard when you have these delays uh, to getting out at sea. And I think that is what brings up whether you're investing in another NOAA core vessel for like scallops or whether you're trying to find other platforms like industry based survey um, platforms to help. Uh, you know, this is this is a much bigger discussion uh, and certainly one that we talked about a little bit uh, this week you know, is NTAP a good venue for that the the Northeast trial advisory panel uh, you know how how do we go about having this conversation because it, it as as Bill pointed out this this has been 25 plus years of uh, similar issues going on um, and it's not doesn't seem like it's going away. So uh, as I tried to relay, it seems like there is renewed momentum to have this more, I guess I would say, creative uh, discussion about how to um, have a robust survey that's not not having problems year in and year out for for all of our species, whether it's the bottom trawl survey or the the scald survey. I'll leave it at that. Because we do already have examples in the Pacific and uh, Alaska and those areas where they utilize the commercial fleet to, to help uh, provide the data necessary for fishery management purposes. So I'm, I, I, I don't know whether that's been looked at. And I'm sure Bill pointed to this. I'd point to what's been going on in Norway for years is, is the commercial fleet being part of the process. So I, the fact that the, these vessels are not even leaving the dock 50% of the time since 2019 is uh, is concerning, and ho hopefully there's something that there, there's some we can we can advance or those can advance uh, the privatization of it um, in order to get them on the water to adequately reflect the status of the stock. So um, it it continues to be frustrating. Thank you, Mike. Any other questions for Melanie? Not seeing any further hands, Mr. Chair. Seeing no further hands. Thank you for your presentation, Melanie. Sorry it took so long. But as always, you're thoughtful and you fulfill your obligations to the commission. Thank you very much. 
Well, I guess we'll move along then to permit the subcommittee updates. Yep. Um, Story Reed is going to cover this. Story, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Jared, should I share my screen? Or are you going to do it? You can share your screen, Story. All right. Here we go. All right. Can you see that? Uh, it's the, yep. Got it. Okay. The full screen. Permitting subcommittee update, June 13th. Great. Thank you. So the permit subcommittee uh, last met on April 11th. And in advance of that meeting, uh, we provided, put together and provided a detailed memo um, in advance of that meeting that Jared also provided in your meeting materials uh, for this meeting. And uh, there's a lot of background in that memo on um, kind of our current transfer program and how we ended up where we are today um, and some specifics on each endorsement. So we won't go through all of that today, um, but I wanted to focus on the three proposals that we talked most about at that meeting and what we're working on now and we'll bring back to the subcommittee and the commission. Um, these are really the first steps in the ongoing conversation with the subcommittee. There's plenty of other ideas that have been voiced on the subcommittee, and we'll continue to discuss, to discuss those and work on those. But to us, these are the, the first steps. So let me go to the next slide. OK. So the first um, proposal we'll call it, that we talked about was to expand our bundling policy, um, which would allow us to bundle certain latent endorsements with coastal lobster permits. And this is allowed by our transfer regulations. It specifically says that certain latent endorsements can be transferred with an active coastal lobster permit, but we haven't taken advantage of that really um, in the two decades it's at, that that's been in the regulation. So to do that, we need to expand our existing bundling policy um, to include certain latent endorsements uh, to be able to go with active coastal lobster permits. And the thinking here is that if we do that, uh, we'll be keeping fishing businesses whole. We'll be giving um, those recipients of those coastal lobster permits and any of those additional endorsements uh, more opportunities. So we're working on that. This will not require a regulatory change. Like I said, it, it will be a change to our bundling policy. So we'll work on drafting that and likely bring it back to the subcommittee soon um, to review. The third proposal um, is to allow the transfer of latent endorsements to immediate family. So this is very similar to the coastal lobster permit transfer program, which allows for the transfer of latent coastal lobster permits between immediate family members, which is defined as um, brother, sister, um, children, grandchildren, wife, husband, things like that. Um, so we want to match that for the transfer of certain latent endorsements. So the key questions here are which endorsements those are, and we're, we're working through that now, and we'll take um, a recommendation back to the permit subcommittee. Um, but it what this does is it keeps fishing families, uh, their businesses, their their uh, traditional fisheries together and allows them to be moved uh, potentially to the next generation, even if they haven't been actively fished in for the past five years. Because remember, right now, um, to transfer any limited entry endorsement, it has to have been actively fished for out of the past five years. So basically, this would allow that to be waived in these situations. The third proposal, um, this is probably the most um, complicated. We have the most work to do here, um, but it has to do with addressing that um, four out of five years actively fish criteria. And basically the question here is, 
is that appropriate for all endorsements? If we want to allow more transferability of certain limited entry endorsements, should we change that four out of five to something different? Three out of five, two out of five. Um, and furthermore, should we review that periodically? Um, the four out of five year activity look back works well for the coastal lobster permit. It's more of a full time fishery. It's well established. But for these limited entry endorsements, um, we've been asked to review that and we think it makes sense to take a look. So the proposal here would be to develop a schedule to routinely review the transferability standards for limited entry endorsements. Um, recently, it was suggested to me that we should look at the scup pot endorsement and reconsider the four out of five to make that more transferable. So what that routine review would look like um, would be DMF doing an analysis of fishery performance, um, available quota, outlooks um, based on recent stock assessments and things like that uh, and work with the permit subcommittee uh, to get advice on what changes might be appropriate. Um, so we'd like to begin this process with um, a few select endorsements in 2023, um, looking towards 2024 for changes. And, and this would require regulatory uh, amendments. So we'd have to go through that process after doing this work. Um, things we'll consider as we go through this is how frequently the review should occur, um, which endorsements to look at and how to bin them. Um, for example, you see here the, the coastal access permit, our mobile gear permit endorsements, and those related to it, like sea bass and fluke, should we bundle those together? Um, should the schedule be aligned with the stock assessment schedule, for example. Um, these are all considerations that we've talked about and will be part of any recommendation. Um, there's one other smaller item that we need to take out and that uh, the coastal lobster permit uh, transfer regs. I mentioned that we do transfer these, uh, even if they've been latent amongst immediate family members. We've been doing that in practice for two decades. And somewhere in that time period, the regs got slightly altered to say we just do that for posthumous transfers. But in, in practice, we do that uh, with any immediate family transfer when we look at it for a variety of reasons. So we're going to clean up that reg. But that's um, what we want to align with the endorsement transfers amongst immediate family members as well. So that's related, uh, but I just wanted to point that out as a small cleanup we have to do. So those were the three, I guess, three plus proposals we talked about um, with more work to do with everything that's been going on um, with prepping regulatory changes for this season. We haven't had a chance to put um, pen to paper on these yet, but we'll be doing that soon and going back to the permit subcommittee, which, uh, I don't think I mentioned, but that subcommittee consists of Shelley Edmondson, um, Bill Doyle, Bill Amaru, and Lou Williams, as a reminder. So we'll be going back to them and getting more good advice from them and continuing other conversations that were started there as well. So I'm happy to take any questions on this. Questions for story or comments from the subcommittee? Shelly, you recognize. Thanks, Ray. This is just more of a comment. I just wanted to say that I think this is a good start. And over the past, I would say five months, I've been helping a number of young fishermen deal with permit transfers. And I think some of these new um, changes would help them receive you know, a more substantial business and allow their new enterprises to, to be stronger. Um, specifically, you know, the bundling policy, I think that change is very helpful. I've seen a couple of permits not transfer because of that. Um, and I think that having this option would really help. So I'm excited to see where things are going. I know there's more to do, but I think this is a, a great um, step forward. So thank, thanks, everyone. Thank you, Shelley. Bill Amaro. Thanks, Ray. <clears throat> yes, absolutely. Shelley is very, very clear and, and it's accurate. Uh, but one of the things that I'm, I'm going to mention, uh, 
the reference she just made was about people who are already fishing and, and having them increase their viability by being able to bundle and accumulate additional accesses to the resources. But what I don't see it is yet is uh, an avenue for apprenticeship for entry of people who currently are not already in possession of permits, but who would like to become fishermen uh, or fishers, period, men and women. I see both along the shoreline. I, I, there, there are, uh, you come to the, to the ports in Chatham in Orleans, in East Ham, you'll see flyers nailed onto the bulkheads and to the pilings asking for uh, information about how to obtain a permit for a particular fishery. Um, th these are, I know some of the people that are putting these up and they're recent high school graduates, they're people who came back from college, maybe it didn't work out or they got a college degree and they don't want to enter that workforce and they're looking for a way to come back to their home community and make a living. So I, I'm hoping that we can do something not only to make transferability uh, a, a, a easier and a benefit to the re existing permit holders, but to create opportunities for incoming fishermen and women to access uh, the, the, the recovering and sometimes very abundant resources that we have. Um, so we haven't really gotten into that very much in, in the short time that we've been a committee and, and met, but perhaps uh, uh, along the lines of the other areas uh, outside of the three major uh, positions that were presented by Story, we could, we could add a fourth and have that be an apprenticeship program for entry into commercial fishing in Massachusetts for those people who haven't currently owned permits or, but would like to. Uh, those, are, those are my comments, and I, I agree with Shelley also that it, it's a start. We, we're making some progress, got the committee active. Uh, I hope there'll be full participation and, and we'll get as much input from the rest of the commission as, as we'll need and from DMF. The staff's done a great job. Uh, Story, you're remarkable in the way you can uh, put our thoughts together and express them for us. Thank you very much for that. I look forward to our next meeting. Thank you, Bill. Bill Doyle. Uh, thank you, Ray. Um, I just want to, along the lines of what Bill just said, um, I think we reconvened this committee in 2019. Um, and one of the reasons I was very interested in this, and I think the reason I was put on it was to investigate new opportunities to get new people, young people into the fisheries to uh, take a look at the possibility of finding some new permits, to look at the possibility of um, making licenses available to a younger group of people so that we can get the next generation coming along. I think that since I've been on the, the uh, MFAC, I've been asking for uh, access to legal counsel to, to find out if that's even uh, possible um, to, to, have, to have an age restricted uh, permit. Um, I've written several uh, communications over the years. I've never received any response. And um, I just wanna, I wanna find out, is this, was this one of the purposes of this committee or am I crazy? Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Story. Could you address that? Yeah, I think that's definitely one of the purposes. And Bill brings up a good question there on whether that idea he mentioned of making permits available to younger fishermen um, with an age restriction is even possible. And we'll look into that and get back to you, Bill. Other comments? Well, this chair story, I concur with uh, the three previous speakers. And I know we've had this subcommittee on the books for many years now. And Bill and I, Bill Doyle and myself, originally expressed our feelings about this. And I agree with Bill Amaru and Bill Doyle. We have to find a venue, an avenue for younger fishermen who haven't got permits, no permits at all. And I'm not talking about a training program. I'm talking about access to buying permits at a reasonable price. 
as opposed to, you know, I mean, that's what's driving a lot of the force away. They can't afford these permits. So I would hope that you'll make your magic story for you the man in the future and, uh, you know, come up with some brilliant ideas on how we can get younger fishermen, younger harvesters, women and men alike, into the fisheries at a reasonable price as opposed to what permits are going for today. Thank you. All right. I appreciate the comments. All noted. Thank you. So are, you are you good here? Any other questions for Story on this? And when is your next subcommittee meeting? Story? We'll, yeah, we'll schedule it. We'll try to find a time that works. Um, you know, over the summer, we need it. So we'll try to find a time that works. Okay. I, I, I certainly hope the entire group, the subcommittee, will be available for that because... This is something that, yeah, as Bill Doyle has said, has been on the books for five years or four years. And uh, I, I mean, I, I give DMF staff so much credit, I mean, because they do respond, but we really need to move this along. And now that the, you know, the latest fishery that we're talking about is scop, and uh, we have to find a way of, of uh, making that an entry fishery for younger fishermen. But time is of the essence here, too. Thank you. Mr. Chair, Bill Hammer has his hand raised. Bill. Yes, very briefly, I just want to let Story know that on July 11th, I'm going to be in the hospital having some surgery, and I'll probably be out of commission for maybe four or five days after that. Uh, so when you put up putting your schedule, just to give you a heads up on that story, okay? July 11th. Ju July 11th. Yep. Got it. We'll stay away from that. Thank, Thank you. you. Any other thoughts before we move on? Jared, no hands. No hands, Mr. Chair. Update on the ongoing rulemaking and future public hearings. Yeah, yeah. I can be real brief on this, Mr. Chair. Uh, well, we have a public hearing um, in two weeks on striped bass, the recreational rules. We'll have to come back to the commission with um, a recommendation for a July meeting on that. Um, then um, I'm still waiting to hear back from my colleagues at NOAA with regards to the recreational haddock and cod rules. Um, seems as though there, there's been delays in their rulemaking process that were more extensive than they had anticipated. Um, hopefully, that gets done in the next few weeks. Um, and we intend to implement complementary measures on an emergency basis. Uh, that will then have to go out to public hearing, I'm thinking probably late July or early August and be brought back to the commission at an August meeting. So um, when I sent the materials for this meeting around last week, I included um, some discussion um, on scheduling meetings for the up for, for the summer, uh, likely two virtual meetings, given they're going to be pretty narrow in scope, um, and then uh, as well as the fall. Um, so I will um, provide some correspondence back to the commission in the coming days with um, an outline of the preferred meeting dates and upcoming public hearings, um, and then we can get those onto the calendar. Thank you, Jared. Any questions for Jared? Not seeing any hands, Mr. Chair. Okay. Bob Glenn, you're up. President yes, thank you, Ray. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, everyone. And thank you for giving me an opportunity to, to present this today. Jared, if you could make let me share my screen, that would probably be the best. All right, Bob, you're all set. Okay, just want to confirm where everyone can see my this, my screen, okay? Yes. All right, thank you. All right, um, so today I'd like to, to kind of give you an overview of um, 
kind of the findings of the derelict fishing gear task force. Um, this has been a, a you know a multi month process that uh, we've worked on, and we're happy to to share this today. Um, so derelict fishing gear today is more commonly referred to as ALDFG, which just simply means uh, abandoned, lost, or otherwise discarded fishing gear. That's a common vernacular used to describe it today. And this can be composed of, of traps, pots, nets, ropes, buoys, etc. In Massachusetts, uh, in our area, it's primarily comprised of lobster traps and rope from our commercial and recreational lobster fisheries. Although there are occasionally also gill nets and other pot trap fisheries uh, mixed in with that. Um, in general, the ADFG uh, causes issues both uh, on land and in the water. And the scale of this issue has increased in recent years as our fisheries have grown and as the materials used to construct fishing gear have evolved. Um, efforts to manage this gear in Massachusetts uh, are hampered by our current laws. And so this is kind of an overview of the presentation that I'm going to give you today. Um, so in July of 2022, Director McKernan uh, formed the Derelict Gear Task Force with a purpose is to study the issue of ALDFG in Massachusetts waters and to develop solutions for the removal of such gear. Uh, our thought here was to comprise a group of members from a broad cross section of stakeholders uh, with experience in commercial fishing, fisheries policy and management, law enforcement, conservation, uh, and derelict fishing gear and retrieval. The members included several DMF staff, including myself, Jared Silva, Dave Chosa, Julie Kaplan, uh, mem Department Counsel, Assistant General Counsel Tori LeBate from the Department of Fish and Game. And then from law enforcement, we had Major Chris Baker. And then from outside the agency, we had uh, Laura Ludwig, Ludwig from the Center for Coastal Studies. We had Beth Cassoni from Mass Lobstermen Association. And then we also had two of our commission members, uh, um, Chair Raymond Kane, who also represents the Cape Cod Fish Commercial Fishermen's Alliance and also Suki Sawyer uh, from the Mass Lobsterman Association, who's also an active lobster permit holder. So this is a really diverse group um, who, with a broad range of, of experience and history in the issue of derelict gear. Uh, so the question is like, why has it become such an issue in recent years? And you know, simply from a broad scale, it's the scale of trap pot fisheries in massive increase and advancements in the material used to construct gear um, has has made it more durable and has allowed it to persist in the environment longer. To give you a sense of the scale of the fishery, this graph uh, demonstrates kind of the, the performance of the lobster fishery in Massachusetts going back to the 1800s. Um, and the solid line is the one I want you to key in on here, and that's the number of traps fished in the Massachusetts fishery. And so you can see early on, uh, you know, we, we had less than 50,000 uh, traps in the water. Uh, and then around, you know, roughly around World War II, we were up around 50,000. And then post-World War II, we kind of saw a steady increase and then a dramatic increase where it reached a peak and traps fished in 1990. Uh, and since that time, it, it's, it's come down a little bit, but uh, it's still fairly a large amount of gear. And so in, in 2019, the scale of our fishery and for the commercial lobster is approximately 250 lobster traps, 12,000 whelk pots, uh, about 4,500 commercial fish pots. And then in 2021, for, for recreational lobster pots, we estimate about 18,500. And based on work that DMF has conducted in the past through a, a grant from the National Fish and Wildlife Federation, we did some, we surveyed the fishing industry, both um, commercially and then in subsequent years, a recreational fishery. And we determined that roughly seven to 10% of fishers, uh, seven, to 10% of gear are lost annually by fishers. And so as a result, derelict gear compounds as more gear is lost annually and the gear previously lost persists indefinitely. The other major contributing factor, as I mentioned earlier, is that the adva adva advancements in plastic and copolymers have led to wide scale use in, in gear construction. So historically, you can see in the upper right corner uh, is an, you know, a typical wooden trap that would have been used in mass fisheries in the 60s, 70s, 80s. 
um, and to a lesser extent in the early 90s. But by about mid-1990s, with the exception of our Outer Cape Cod fishery, which still use wooden lathe traps, uh, greater than 95% of the traps deployed in Massachusetts are made of polyvinyl coated steel mesh, which is in the lower right corner picture. Um, and so and this is a much more durable um, material and it, it lasts for quite a long time. In the same time, historically, uh, you know, rope was made of jute, which is a biodegradable material. And now with advancements in plastics, we most of the vast majority of all rope used in commercial fisheries are made of polyethylene and polypropylene. And these materials are not biodegradable. And then based on some gear retrieval work conducted by the Center for Coastal Studies, um, the empirical evidence suggests that this these gears can modern gears can persist in the environment for an excess of a decade and that's based on looking at the trap tags uh, that come up on gear re retrieved in that program and then we, so we know that they even after a loss they, they they continue to to stay intact for quite a long time um so what are the impacts of ALDFG in the marine environment? So there are several, that, and they're fairly well understood. Um, ghost fishing is a big problem. It occurs when abandoned traps continue to catch and kill lobsters, crabs, and fish. Um, and this can impact stock size and reproductive capacity because they contribute to total mort mortality of both target species and non-target species. Um, and it, ultimately, this can negatively affect landings and net revenues. Uh, back in 2015, Division Marine Fisheries uh, initiated uh, a multi-year study on ghost fishing with funding from the National Fish and Wildlife uh, Foundation, whereby we abandoned uh, several strings of commercial pot gear uh, on the bottom, and then we had divers go back and visit it every other week for a two-year period. And basically what we find is found is that, by and large, the the biodegradable panels and lobster traps that are designed to fail after a few months continue to, to stay intact when they're left on the bottom because corrosion doesn't occur when they're not exposed to the, to the air and then back to the, the ocean. And as a result, we found that these traps, even at the conclusion of the two-year study, were still intact and still uh, killing uh, lobsters, crabs, and fish at a fairly reg relative rate, uh, regular rate. Uh, other impacts can it can cause damages to habitats, including things like uh, eelgrass and corals when balls of derelict fishing gear kind of surge back and forth with, with tides and storms. And th this can this can uh, cause damage to those habitats. Um, and then also this it's been found that this can generate microplastic debris as it breaks down in the ocean. Uh, another big issue, uh, one that I deal with. Uh, quite a bit is entanglement risk to protected species. Uh, buoyed ALDFG can entangle whales and sea turtles. And one of the biggest issues that we're concerned with is that this dilutes the effectiveness of the risk reduction measures the industry undertakes to protect North Atlantic right whales. And so as you're aware, uh, we have several uh, closures in the lobster fishery designed to protect North Atlantic right whales will require all gear to become out of the water. And any, any buoyed gear that's abandoned or lost um, can then pose, you know, entanglement risk to those animals. Um, and as a result of this, DMF has to run a costly and labor intensive uh, retrieval program to make sure that this gear is out of the way out of for, from protected species uh, during the closure. Um, another issue is that uh, derelict fishing gear can cause navigation hazard and gear conflicts. So buoyed ALDFG poses a navigation hazard to boaters who get caught who gets rope caught, caught uh, excuse me, who get ropes caught in their propellers. And then unbuoyed ALDFG causes gear conflict issues with mobile gear fishers who inadvertently tow their nets or dredges uh, through it in the ocean floor. Uh, both of these things can cause a safety risk to the mariner, um, and both of these things can cause da both damage to the vessel and gear uh, in some events. In, in addition to causing impact to the marine environment, there are also issues related to a deal. I'm just going to call it derelict gear because I'm tired of saying that an acronym a million times. Um, it, there are several issues associated with derelict gear that when it washes up on shore. Uh, and that and typically what happens is, is during large storm events, gear that's out in the that's caught out in the storms kind of gets balled up 
uh, and then surge and, and, and tidal action deposits it's up on, on coastal areas, on beaches. Um, and this is typically, as I said, occurs after large storm events, especially nor'easters. Um, most of the gear that is washed up, and this is kind of an important point to this issue, as you can see from these pictures, are severely damaged. I mean, this isn't this isn't salvageable fishing gear that's of any value. This is just big, you know. This is largely just marine debris. It's chunk, big chunks of traps and balls of rope, um, and this, you know, this litters coastal beaches and all creates an eyesore issue. And it also creates a real management issue for municipalities and property owners um, who who have to deal with it. As you can see in the inset picture here, uh, you know, heavy equipment heavy equipment being used to to remove a big gear ball off one of our beaches um, this also can create a little bit of a safety issue for unknowing beachgoers uh, a lot of times fragments of these traps will will break off and get you know buried in the sand and and folks will step on them and injure their their feet and etc and in general overall arching issues with derelict fishing gear is is Disposal and removal are very difficult under current mass law. Uh, derelict gear, even damaged and non-functional gear, are considered personal property, and so technically, uh, this gear cannot be disposed of without notifying the owners and giving them sixty days to claim it. Um, it's also it's costly and logistically difficult to remove and transport. Uh, large quantities of gear often require use of heavy equipment and large trucks. Um, in many cases, this gear is washing up in remote or other areas that are logistically difficult uh, to, to, to access or on private property where access is an issue. Um, and then if, relative to retrieving gear that's lost in the sea floor, it requires use of, of special sonar equipment and grappling gear to, to retrieve it, which is very you know, labor intensive and costly as well. And then finally, uh, when we are trying to manage this gear, we find that most municipal lands fills will not accept it, um, and that in in general the damage to that gear it's it's not really salvageable. It's not really worth repurposing. So we're just left left with a large amount uh, of basically marine debris that we we need to manage, and, and it causes a lot of logistical issues. Um, so trying to get an overview of the statement of the underlying issue here problem is that. Uh, that, you know, we really understand the the issues related to it. Uh, there, there are numerous problems that impacts from derelict fishing gear, and these are, you know, these are pretty well understood. And in general, we have a, a strong interest in addressing the issue. DMF and the Mass Environmental Police have, police have been working on this for decades. Um, we get interest from municipalities, conservation groups, and commercial fishermen who are interested in, in cleaning this up. But unfortunately, because of our, our current state laws, the efficient management of this is, is not really possible. Um, I'm going to briefly just go over the two general laws in question here for, um, that kind of uh, handcuff us relative to dealing with, with derelict fishing gear. Um, and that the first one is uh, Mass General Law in Chapter 130, uh, Section 31. And basically what that what Section 31 does is it, it basically protects all fishing gear um, defined here of the, that washes up um, on the on the shore beaches or flats uh, basically that that no one can can molest touch or otherwise you know do anything with fishing gear that that washes up and then second is section 32 which, which essentially, lays out the course of action when it does wash up. Um, and so in this section, um, whether it's on public or private land, the owner of the fishing gear are allowed to up to 30 days to go recover it um, and without any liability of trespass. And then in the event that they don't, um, the, the property owner essentially has um, to re give them 60 days uh, prior to them being able to um, basically take ownership of, of that gear. And, and because of this, um, we're, we're not able to really allow uh, large scale just uh, beach cleanups or, or fishing gear cleanups in general uh, without having supervision from 
mass environmental police. Um, and so, as I mentioned, it, you know, it, it can only right now, we can only allow this under the authority of supervision of MEP under chapter 130, section nine. Um, and essentially the statutes, these chapter 31 and chapter 32 uh, they're antiquated. They were enacted in, in 1941 when, as I showed you, the, the fishery was much smaller and the material uh, you used to construct gear were, were biogradable at this point. So we didn't have uh, the scale of the derelict fishing gear issue back then, and nor could have the, the, the legislature at the time envisioned neither the scale or the fact that advances in materials would make this, this gear uh, last indefinitely and it become such a problem. Um, the other issues with, with these statues is that what we found is that it does not, they do not differentiate between intact fishing gear and fishing gear debris. And th this is kind of a key, dis key distinction um, in trying to be able to differentiate uh, fishing gear that would likely be still valuable to the owner and worth salvaging versus just debris that is not. And so that's something that uh, we, we hope to to address with this. Um, and also they did not consider the impacts of ghost fishing and, and proliferation that we've learned about um, through research. And certainly at the time, they did not consider the impacts that a buoy derelict fishing gear would have on protected species. Uh, so recommendations um, from the group was to develop a comprehensive management strategy that balances property rights with the need to efficiently handle and clean up derelict fishing gear. And this would primarily require a legislative solution. And so we're recommending that, um, that the legislature consider amending uh, chapter 130, section 31, to, so that it still maintains the property rights for fishing gear, but allows DMF to regulate the handling of derelict fishing gear, or in this case, a ALDFG. We're, we're recommending rescinding chapter uh, 130 section 32 uh, because we feel that that the that we can handle this via regulation uh, relative to differentiating between gear that's valuable and should be given back to the owner versus gear that can be uh, destroyed or repurposed and then finally we, we noted that um, there are several areas where we need to refine statutory definitions in chapter one uh, and that's for one uh, to de to define, make make changes to the definition of closed season, uh, make a new definition for open season, and and this relates back to uh, the need to manage derelict fishing gear during our trap pot closures to protect North Atlantic right whales. And so uh, we want to have the ability for for gear that's left behind in the water during that closure to be able to. Uh, quickly and effectively remove it and dispose of that gear. And in addition, uh, we also need to adopt new definitions uh, to, to differentiate between fishing gear and fishing gear debris. And so the, the proposed modification here, you can see is that we, we've kind of eliminated in this the, the specific language that spells out in the statute, fish trap, seine, lobster, crab pot, etc., and replace that with with fishing gear, and then added, notwithstanding uh, the Division of Marine Fisheries with the approval of the Marine Fisheries Advisory Commission and the Department of Fish and Game, shall promulgate regulations that authorize, that may authorize or permit the removal of fishing gear from the waters under the jurisdiction of the Commonwealth and the adjacent coastal shoreline. Fishing gear debris collected under the division authority shall not be subjected to general law chapter 134. So this gets back to the property ownership laws. And so what we're trying to do here is distinguish fishing gear from fishing gear debris and essentially um, then give us the, the authority to, to basically dispose of fishing gear de debris in this case. I think Dan has his hand raised. No, Bob, I'm going to wait until you. Okay, finish. thanks. Sorry. Yeah, I just saw it pop up. Um, and, and as I noted, we just we, we were recommending to outright rescind Chapter 32, which does away with the need for a property owner to to um, uh, give 60 days notice to the before they can take ownership of the gear and an additional 30 days for them to come retrieve it. 
Um, and then I kind of wanted to get into definitions a little bit uh, under chapter one. Um, the, this is what we found uh, the, where I think the meat of the matter really lies. And so the, the, the task force kind of dove in with trying to be fairly surgical in creating a few definitions that allow us to make distinctions that easily separate uh, the difference between intact fishing gear and what we would consider, you know, marine uh, fishing gear debris. Um, so in this case, uh, we'd like to include a definition in chapter one for fishing gear, which would be a, a trap net fish car or other contrivance that is intact, keyword intact, uh, functions as, as is, is intended to take hold or capture fish and is maintained in the water during an open season. And so again, open season is a new clear additional distinction here. Uh, the reason for that is it, for that specific language of open season is that we would like to be able to just remove and get rid of a gear that is left open, uh, left in the water during a closed season. Uh, and so we would, it would not under, under the, this new definition, gear left behind in a closed area would not be considered uh, intact fi or fishing gear. It would be classified as fishing gear debris. And so along those lines, uh, we would add a definition for fishing gear debris, which would be a trap net fish car or other contrivance that is not intact, does not function as in intended to take hold or capture fish or, or is maintained during a closed season. Um, additionally, uh, currently the definition for closed season is it simply the time during which fish cannot be lawfully taken. Um, we would like to amend that from cl to closed season, the time during which fish cannot be lawfully taken or area when and where the use of fishing gear is prohibited. And so this distinction basically we want to make sure that in cases when there is a close season that although fish can't we know fish can't be landed that in this case it's also the gear cannot be left uh in the ocean and i think that's just a, a another kind of safeguard relative to not you know giving situations whereby uh we're contributing to um the issue the you know the fishing um, derelict fishing gear issue um and then finally adopting which is not currently in the chapter a definition for open season which is the time during which fish may be lawfully be taken or the time or area where the use of a particular fishing gear is allowed uh, so again it, making the distinction of, of that you can both fish and also you can have gear in the water at that time um, part of this of dmf uh, through the, these statutory changes would be giving DMF the regulatory authority to, to um, or, I'm sorry, the authority to regulate uh, derelict fishing gear. Uh, and so one of the things that DMF and the, would need to consider and that the, this task force spent a lot of time kind of getting into the weeds and discussing uh, was the need for defining intact commercial fishing gear. Uh, luckily, uh, there is a lot of precedent throughout the country, other states who have uh, who've kind of uh, tackled this issue and have, have come up with some definitions. And, and largely uh, what we found was um, that a, it, it's often not just one element or one su succinct um, definition that you can give intact fishing gear, but rather it's a, a number of, of considerations or a number of conditions that you can you can dictate. Uh, and so what we came up with is for a commercial trap to constitute intact fishing gear, it must have at least three of the following elements. And so that is a, a buoy um, that is marked as set forth in CMR 4.13, uh, a, a buoy line that complies with marking and modifications required set forth in CMR 12. Uh, current year's trap tag associated with the valid current year's fishing permit set forth in CMR 6, uh, period 31. And, or finally, a trap gear configuration requirements set forth in chapter, I mean, sorry, in CMR 6. 
And CMR6 basically defines all the required elements of a trap, such as escape vent, uh, functioning um, ghost panel, ex and trap tags, et cetera, et cetera. And so th what this intact definition essentially does is one, it ensures that the owner is identifiable. Um, the trap has all the elements that make it functional and that the buoy line is identifiable to the fishery. And, and so these are kind of three primary components that we think are a good distinction to basically separate an intact fishing gear from uh, what we would consider fishing gear debris. Um, other things that DMF will, will need to consider in the regulatory framework would be uh, the need to kind of uh, give clear guidance on how the public may interact with intact fishing gear and also fishing gear debris. And this includes defining who may handle the gear, when the gear may be handled, what collection methods would be allowable, from where the gear may be removed, uh, whether permitting and reporting is required, and what post removal options exist. And when you with all within this uh we, we expect there to be an, a kind of four primary circumstances where uh the public or or state agencies would interact with aldfg and that would be what during a shore cleanup uh directed at sea gear removal so pr programs like the center for coastal studies have done where they received a grant to use sonar and then tow grapples to to retrieve uh derelict fishing gear on the bottom um incidental recovery and so this would be a, a good example of this and this for anyone any of the folks on the commission who are experienced mobile gear fishing they can relate to this is it's very common over the course of, of running an auto trawl or a scalp dredge whatever to run into lost fishing gear uh derelict fishing gear on the bottom and right now again because of these these current state statutes that gear has to basically uh, just be thrown back over because they're not allowed to, to possess it. And so one of the things that we hope to regulate is the allowance for when a mobile gear fisher runs into said gear, instead of just tossing it back over, that they're able to to bring it back in into port um, and dispose of it a, a pro, a pro, properly. And then finally, uh, just enforcement actions. And this is already, we don't need any new framework for this. This is already... We have the authority, or Mass Environment and Police have the authority, and we already have ongoing gear retrieval work going on, but th this is one of the other circumstances. And then uh, closing out here, the benefits to having DMF regulate uh, ALDFG is that what we've learned is that, ALD, that the challenges related to ALDFG, they're not static um, and they evolve over time. And so uh, unanticipated things like changes in how gear configuration, gear construction, seasons, fisheries, they, they change. Um, be, and uh, as a result, uh, there's a need to kind of change the strategy uh, to, to manage the issue. Um, DMF has the ability to respond to these changes through its regulatory process, typically within, within six months, which makes us fairly adept uh, and, and nimble in, in trying to uh, meet, you know, on upcoming challenges. And then finally, it, it's also important here that the our regulatory approach benefits from being fine-tuned for the Marine Fisheries Commission in this case, and where we have that that extra uh, oversight and that experience of commercial fishers here who can, can help us uh, respond. And then also finally, that these regulations are subject to review and approval by both the commissioner um, and the governor. And so uh, with that, um, I'm happy to take any questions. Hey, Bob, if I could just weigh in, I, I just want to make a couple of comments before you take the questions. Um, so you can, the commission can see here how well uh, refined these proposals are, and it, and it really reflects the great input we got from not only the, the participants like the Center for Coastal Studies, uh, but also uh, law enforcement and, of course, legal counsel. You know, we had, uh, we've, uh, you mentioned Tori uh, Labate from uh, the Department of Fish and Game, but uh, we, she also uh, had the assistance of, 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 of her um, the uh, lead counsel, Jennifer Sula, and I think the Executive Office of Environmental Affairs attorneys got involved as well. So this is really well-baked. 
I also want to mention this. This this is from 25 years of experience that we've dealt with grabbing gear and and being really challenged with with what do we do with it. So from the early years of the of the right well conservation uh, regulations that we enacted back in the 90s, we've created a marking scheme that was specific to um, to gear that was going to be left during the winter. It was a special marking scheme just below the buoy that would that would uh, distinguish between abandoned gear and active gear. Uh, and then we even banned um, single traps during the winter um, so that we could, again, identify the lost gear from the from the uh, active gear and also try to discourage the recreational gear from being left out there. But for 25 years, we've really challenged, uh, we've been so challenged with, all right, now that we've grabbed the gear, um, now, how do we dispose of it? You know, and and if someone's lost a single trap, um, they just don't come get it. You know what I mean? Even though we've we've been we, we'd have a gear storage and we put the stuff aside, and more recently, you know, we've seized more and more gear because of the uh, increasing threat, but also because now we have large scale closures. And so I, I can't thank you, uh, you, Bob, you and the team enough for 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 all the work you've done on this and this is your your maiden run or your first run with the with this presentation you did a great job and we're going to give it to the coastal caucus uh that is uh, the leg all the legislators that have um, coastal districts are part of what's called the coastal caucus and we've asked for an audience uh, with them um as soon as it is convenient for them um and so I, uh, and I assume, so just to finish up, and maybe this is a question for Jared as well, I believe that we anticipate um, using Section 17A, uh, which is the statute where we bring the commission in for, uh, you know, requisite uh, approval uh, in order to enact a final rule. So the commission does get a, a hand in our development of final rules. Yeah, I guess that's it, the question. It's, it's not explicitly in 17A. The, well, at this time, the way we've, configured the statutory amendments or are proposing the statutory amendments is that there'll be a new authority granted to the commission at section 31, I believe, to to consult with DMF and approve DMF regulations on this subject. So it wouldn't be a yes. 17A issue. It's a, it's a separate 30. Okay. Yeah, that's what I'm getting at. Just so the, the nine but commission members on this call know that they, they're going to have a role in, in reviewing and approving the final rules. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, okay. Input's critical on this, particularly yeah. given experience across fisheries and you know, kind of vetting our ideas as to what how gear should be handled once it's, once All right. it's brought up. All right, so thanks. Thank you, Dan. Khalil? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to say, sitting here in the audience, looking at this or uh, viewing this presentation, it was absolutely awesome. Uh, one one section led to the other section in a logical manner. Uh, and every time I every time I had a question, I wrote it down in my logbook here. And then uh, as the present presentation went on, the, the question was answered. So it was a very logical, very clear, concise, and it was a I I, I feel very well done um, presentation. The only question I have is, uh, I, 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 and I guess it's, it's a financial one. Who who incurs the cost of the cleanup. Um, if if a owner can be recognized as to if it was intentionally left in the water, for instance, uh, during the, the closure for the right whale, it was intentionally left in the, in the in the water, and then we had to retrieve it. Does the owner incur that cost, or do we pick up that cost? That is the state or the taxpayers. Yeah. So so currently, Khalil, that's a good question. Um, if when we uh, do our gear retrieval program for gear that's left behind during the closure, uh, that's funded um, from the state. So essentially taxpayers are, are paying to have that uh, removed. Um, when it washes up on shore, it's, it's kind of a, a, you know, it's a di kind of a different story. In some cases it, in smaller scale issues, the landowner may just uh, take it upon himself to, to clean it up. Or as you, as I had in those pictures, in some cases that the, the, the scale is so big that it requires municipalities to get you know involved and to, to bring in uh, heavy equipment to remove it so again in those cases um it's 
it would be back on the the town or the taxpayers in that case. Um, in many cases, that the, on these, especially when it washes up on shore, the owners are not. You really can't identify the owners because the gear is so badly damaged. Uh, so it's it's kind of a, a gray area. Thank you so much. And again, this this it was. I I felt it was such a well done presentation. I want to commend you and your your team for putting to, putting it together. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Khalil. Questions for Bob Glenn. Not seeing any further hands raised, Mr. Chair. Further hands raised. Thank you very much for your presentation, oh. Bob. Uh, Suki, okay, did you have a comment? Yeah, just a comment. Uh, just to go down the road a little further. I mean, the presentation was great, and Dan and the team did a good job putting it all together. I, you know, changing the rules for people to be able to bring gear in, you know, mobile guys, mobile gear guys. The issues is always going to be, what are they going to do with it when they bring it in? I have no issues with drag of, you know, hooks up some of my traps. I'm glad they, they he called me and, and gave them back to me because, you know, that's what takes place now. But if somebody gets lost gear up and they get to the shore, especially some, some communities do not want to have a, the, uh, Marine debris uh, uh, dumpsters on the, you know, to deal with it at the DPW or wherever they have, you know, composting facilities or whatever. And it's just, I think the state needs to do more to try to get all the communities on the same page about what people can do with some of this gear that comes ashore because the disposal part of it is the biggest issue, I think. Thank you. Yes, Suki, you know, thank you. And I, I agree 100% that, that it, you know, the disposal has been one of our biggest challenges and is the biggest challenge for, for anyone involved uh, with this. And so one of the things I think moving forward and maybe future work for the, the task force is going to be to look at um, how other places are dealing with it, but in general to, to come up with uh, some some additional solutions to allow easy uh, disposal of this for, you know, at, at all kind of our major ports, uh, because it is a reoccurring issue. And, and we certainly just try to get rid of the gear we get from the gear hollow. It's been a real challenge. So we, we need to may look into funding opportunities to get more broadly, broadly distributed um, receptacles to, to, to deal with this and, and, our, and or recycling program. So uh, agreed. Thanks. Yeah, for sure. Okay, Bob. Thanks. Bill Amaro. Bill, thank, you, Ray. thank you, Ray. I, I, I just wanted to mention that at the uh, lobster show this past year in Hyannis, there is a company, and I think they operate in several different ports. Uh, I know the representative lives in Truro who, who takes uh, at least the plastics. I don't, you know, the metal parts of the traps are, are a different issue, but they can handle netting, twine, uh, rope, and anything that's in the polypropylene field. And they, they recycle it into different products. And uh, does anybody recall seeing that booth at, at the show back in, in the winter up in Hyannis? It's called Net Your Problem. There you have it. Thank you very much. And yeah, uh, so there is, there, there is a private company already involved in the recycling of some of the materials, at least, Net Your Problem. <clears throat> Yeah, no, good insight, Bill. And we've actually connected with them this past year. Uh, several totes of rope that we got from the Gale Hollow program um, were, were given to them. So uh, we're hoping there's future opportunities to, to expand on that. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Not seeing any, Mr. Chair. Bob, Bob uh, it's Ray Kane. I would suggest when you give your presentation to the coastal community politicians, whether they're state reps or senators, that maybe you can address the issue which Suki brought up, uh, where they can turn around to their townships and say, hey, we've got this issue. The towns have to start working, you know, within the issue, finding a place at the transfer station for this gear, because I know it's been a strain on DMF for years now, but I think that's a politician's role to turn around to their townships, wh whoever's in their district and relay the message. It's just a thought. 
Thank you. No, that's great feedback, Ray, and 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 certainly one that I'll add. Thank you. No other questions or comments for Bob. Thank you, Bob. It was a great presentation as always. Uh, I, I'm I'm blown away every time we have a commission meeting and I hear the entire DMF staff address different issues. You've got to be proud of yourselves. Well, we'll move along on the uh, roster here. Uh, commission member comments. I'm going to go around the table, starting with Shelly Edmondson. Shelly? Thanks, Ray. I don't have any comments. Thank you, Shelly. Khalil? All set. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Khalil. Lou Williams? I already just, <clears throat> just had a question for uh, maybe Dan could answer. I got a phone call this morning from uh, one of the pogi boats, and he was looking at his um, paperwork on um, on uh, you know his the criteria for the permit, and um, he was surprised to see. And I didn't have an answer for him, so I don't remember us talking about it. That no spotter planes uh, until eight o'clock in the morning, which he said is pretty problematic because he. He said his plane generally has a tough time between eight and eleven with the sun, um, and they generally usually, you know, see the fish early in the morning. So I, I just didn't know where that came from. So yeah, Lou, uh, I think that's a historical. That, where that I think, that, I think that's a remember. historical condition that's been placed on those. And I would turn to uh, Jared or or Story. Um, that that condition's been on the permit for a while, has it not? No, we're wrapping up. Maybe yeah, we Long didn't. I bet a DMF. Agreed. Yeah, we I think he just that. Yeah. he just hasn't noticed it. I think we had a lot of complaints back in the '80s, especially um, when the pogies are deep inside, um, you know, the embayments, and you have you have spotter pilots or spotter planes circling over neighborhoods at fairly low altitudes. Um, mm -hmm. Right. So yeah. Um, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, because he said he, had, you know, he has his plane has been he's been using it, and he said he says I know that some planes he, he said to me fly low, which we don't. They fly about two thousand feet. He said, no, oh, yeah, and, okay. uh, he just had never seen. You no, know, he's he's been up here a number of years, and, and he just never seen that in his um, paperwork before. You know what I mean? So sure. I don't know. we'll take a look so, at that, and we'll we'll get back to you and the the permit holder figure out who okay. that is. Okay. Yeah. Okay, Dan. Thank you. Thank you, Lou. Bill Amaro. Thanks, Ray. Uh, I do have a comment. I spoke to one of the trawler fishermen who fishes for horseshoe crabs, and he mentioned to me that the 30 minute maximum tow length may be counterproductive towards uh, lowering mortality on crabs. I know the idea is to not overload the cod end with, with individual crabs because of what uh, can happen to them when they're crushed together. But his point, and I think it was valid when he, he said that the, the uh, the mortality doesn't occur when the net is in the water. You know, things are pretty fluid when they're being towed through the water. There's a lot of cushioning from the water. The damage occurs when the crabs are dumped onto the deck. Hey, Bill, we didn't yes. adopt it. Oh, it wasn't adopted? No. Okay. Uh, then I guess this point is moot. That yeah, the, uh, yeah, the yeah we, we heard the same comment and we, we yeah. agreed with them. Yep. Good. All right. I'll let him know. Thank That's you. it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Mike Piedna. Michael? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Suki Sawyer. Yeah, oh, just a, yeah, just an observation, Ray. Thanks. Uh, striper friend of mine in the, uh, in the end of last week caught a nice striper outside of breakwater. And just when he was going to bring alongside a boat, a big poor beagle, I think he identified it as, came along and bit it right out of his, you know, basically out of his hands. And then another got another fish later on, you know, a little while after that, and you never saw it, but it got bit off also. So I think there's a lot of sharks showing up in the area kind of early this time of year, but people should be aware that there's sharks operating close to shore around Cape Ann already. Just observation, that's all. Thank you, Suki. You might want to talk to Dr. Scalmo. Give him a ring. Uh, Bill Doyle. Uh, thank you, Ray. Um, just just two things I want to bring up on what um, Suki just said about the sharks. Uh, perhaps we should just review the shark uh, data from the uh, the buoys that was just released a short time ago at our next meeting. And the other thing is, 
Um, and I'm not sure how this how this fits in, but um, can we start taking a look at weather and how that's affecting our fisheries um, with with global warming? And that's that's all I have. Thank you. Yes, I believe uh, the uh, vice chair, Mike Piernock, is uh, vice chair of the EBFM committee at the council level. So I'm sure he can give us a report down the road. Thank you, Bill. Tim Brady, closing comments. Uh, I'm good. Thanks, Ray. I uh, appreciate the, the looking at the, um, the lobster gear because um, over the years, once in a while, I'd get into a trawl and, you know, the way that I usually do it, I'd get into a trawl with my anchor if, if I actually got the bridle or the pot itself and I had to cut it, I'd put it up on my bow and bring it in and hopefully give it back to the lobsterman in good shape. But um, yeah, to, to sort that out legally so that, you know, I think fishermen are trying to do the right thing, but you, we do need, it'll be good to clarify legally that, that you can do something like that and you're not you're not breaking any law. Yes, thank you, Tim. Yeah, I'm, I'm very happy to see DMF move on this. Now it's a matter of moving the legislators so it doesn't take five years to get this enacted. Thank you for your comment, Tim. I would just once again like to thank the entire DMF staff. You're so professional at these meetings, the way you present and explain things to commission members. And once again, I want to graciously thank the attendance of our commission members. I, I've never seen a commission so well organized and maintained. I know Jared puts work, a lot of work into this, but for the commission members to make these monthly meetings, for me, believe me, it's been shocking over the years from the past to the present. So I want to thank commission members once again, the entire team and staff. I'm going to open this up to public comment now. Jared, anybody in the public want to comment? Emerson Hasbrook, you're recognized. You're going to mute yourself. Thank you. Can you hear me? I can, yes. Yeah, thank you. Um, and thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And uh, thank you, Bob, for your excellent presentation. Uh, my name is Emerson Hasbrook. I'm with the Cornell Marine Program, in Long Island, New York. and. Uh, I want to commend Massachusetts for developing a plan to address um, derelict fishing gear. Um, over the past many years, we at Cornell have been removing derelict lobster pots from the New York waters of Long Island Sound. And to date, we've removed over 20,000 pots. And uh, the wire pots are recycled and, and the rope and so forth uh, goes to um, an incinerator um, energy plant. And we use current lobster fishermen and their vessels as our platform for the removal of uh, derelict pots. And um, we've had a lot of success with a modified grapple system that we've de developed with the fishing industry that's a little bit different than the one that I, I saw in Bob's um, uh, presentation. And uh, we'd be happy to provide any information to your efforts in Massachusetts um, um, if desired. And we've also dealt with many of the issues that that Bob raised. Um, you know, regulatory issues are a little bit different in New York, but, you know, we've had regulatory issues as well as logistical issues that we've dealt with over the years. Um, and then on a different subject, uh, for what it's worth, uh, on an issue that, that, that Bill raised, um, in New York, we're also grappling with the issue of permit transfer and how to allow new rent entrance. So um, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Emerson. Jared, anybody else from the public want to comment? I'm not seeing any further hands raised, Mr. Chair. No further hands from the public. Uh, I need a motion to adjourn. Hello, motion Don't to move. adjourn. Bill, thank you. I need a second. I'll second that. Thank you, Lou. Seeing no objections, this uh, meeting has been adjourned.